here we go with Doom Drop Podcast number four. Ooh. Got Shun, myself. I think we're going to be looking to get some guests on the hook pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, just kind of opening things up with some conversations between Shun and myself. We're going to talk about uh, a few different things today, um, including some of our background and that kind of thing, so you guys can get a feeling for who we are. Uh, a little bit more, and uh, yeah, we've got some good topics here today, but first thing that we both wanted to talk about, we both mm. uh, both were mentioning this going into the podcast, was uh, talking about the Neuralink news. Right. Yeah, we both had that same topic on our agenda, which was very funny. We both wanted to come in talking about that. <laughs> so if you guys haven't heard the news in the past couple of weeks, the very first ever Neuralink was uh, surgically implanted into a paraplegic man, guy who mm -hmm. had some sort of accident. Uh, I think it was a diving accident. Uh, can't move his arms or his legs. Everything below the, the neck is completely paralyzed. And uh, they did the surgery. He recovered really quickly and they got him on the, the Neuralink. And he can't say enough good things about it. If you watch the video, right. you go ahead and, and search, you know, first Neuralink patient. I'm sure you can find the video. Uh, he is just like super excited and bombastic about how good the the software is, even though it's the first generation, you know, it's the first ever one. He's just blown away because there's not a lot of um, tools for people who are paraplegic. No. Well, yeah, I mean, he's kind of resorting, if it wasn't for Neuralink, he'd basically be resorting to some kind of mouth stick, which is basically like, it sounds it sounds how it is. It's basically a stick that goes in your mouth and has like a bit of fabric at the end. So you can still use like a touch screen, like an iPad or iPhone or something. But um, besides that, he would have access to use his wheelchair through the use of a straw. And basically, it has two functions, uh, sucking and blowing. So say by, by blowing it hard or soft, it will make it go forward or turn right. And by sucking hard or soft, it will make it turn left or go backwards. So it has some functionality through conventional means, but to be honest, very limited. Whereas with Neuralink, the guy was able to like stay up all night, I think for like seven and a half hours playing Civilization VI and having a blast playing his career. So yeah, like definitely a different kind of game changing thing we're talking about here. Yeah, just I mean, I can't imagine how trapped you must feel in your own body. Um, being a paraplegic, you can't move or do right. anything. You're just uh, you know, relegated to a few hours a day maximum of mouth stick use, of course, right? Like mouth stick, it sounds so barbaric. Um just such a blunt tool to try and navigate the technological world um and then on top of that you can only use it for a couple hours because you're going to get mouth sores and all kinds right. of problems That's something i didn't even think about but he was talking about it and uh yeah it sounds incredibly frustrating but with the Neuralink tool he's able to uh, use all kinds of different software um, he's able to control things around him his computer his uh other devices, I mean, it's just incredible. It's really incredible what the, the new technology can do. And, um, yeah, he's super, super excited about it, and I can't blame him at all. Uh, he's yeah, been, yeah. His, his life's been kind of opened up, I think, after using that for the first time. Well, yeah, not only that, but, I mean, this guy kind of, like... It, it everything fell into his lap the stars kind of aligned for him to for this to happen like he he also just so happened to live only two hours away from the hospital they set up to do it like everything was just kind of falling into place for him and he was the kind of the guy that was like wanting to like you know take the earliest available appointments the earliest possible interviews and you know like try and crank it out. and when they did go to collect data on him when he first like had this stuff going he was like doing like a crazy session where he was like knocking it out of the park and giving them like better data than they'd ever gotten before and like beating all their previous scores of like how much he was able to like interface with it and actually get like more clicks with his brain so to speak you know what i mean like, so he, he knocked it out of the park as well like as not just not just the fact that he's the first patient but it also seems like his ethic in the process was you know very commendable i found it so interesting like his explanation too of kind of how it works is that as mm. a paraplegic guy um, he says that 
he can feel he can still kind of feel where his hands and arms and legs are and stuff right. and although he can't feel any sensation from them he can he like he can feel the mind body connection um mm -hmm. of like trying to move his hand you know he can feel that um he can try to do that even though you know he can't feel anything like you can just imagine you trying to move your hand but it doesn't move at all right that's it's really hard right. to even imagine it but but what he was saying is that with the Neuralink software um he was able to kind of bind commands to these different body movements so like lifting his left finger would be like a, a click or something like that you know what i mean or pressing his left finger would be a click and so mentally he would do that and the neural link would pick up on the brain signal and bind that to a certain key function which would be the click and then whenever he wants to click he just thinks about moving his finger or pressing his finger and boom he gets a click function right. it's so interesting yeah, he he did say it's extremely hard to explain the sensations that he feels while he's interfacing with it in that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was basically along those lines where he was saying it's, it's it's like he's still using his hands to do those things in terms of the sensations he's feeling. It's just mm -hmm. he's not actually doing that. It's all mental. But the sensations that he's experiencing are like he has those, like a phantom limb type deal where he's actually still kind of using those uh, implements that have been rendered uh you know not quite as functional as he'd like them to be somehow it's now like a matrix type deal where his brain is now being stimulated in such a way with the electrical signals that it's like he's actually moving his limbs and fingers and again to interface with this yeah one thing he said he was super excited about was that uh, the potential for the the software and that in the future maybe people could have an injury like him go to the uh, go to the doctor and get an implant and then be able to walk out again so i guess the idea is that you would have like an electronic bridge uh, over your spinal cord where uh, the the to brain the signals yeah the brain signals are being picked up by your uh, neuralink and then there's like another you know stimulator on the other side of that bridge um, that's you know controlling your body and so that it, you kind of map it out like this is what it feels like to move my right arm uh, like, mm -hmm. and then they it kind of like uh, sets it up so that you're not moving your body, but you're sending a signal to the Neuralink, and the Neuralink is moving your body, and you could become like unparaplegic from doing that. It would be kind of incredible. I mean, that's obviously a long way down the line, but he's immediately that's where his head is going. Right, he's thinking like there may be a day when nobody is paraplegic anymore. Right. If you guys are having a hard time like wrapping your mind around like what exactly we're talking about, if you've ever seen the show Rick and Morty, there's an episode uh, called Pickle Rick where he kind of uses like the body parts of a rat to kind of build assemble like a, a bodysuit, if you will, and he's using electrical signals to send to those limbs to activate them, even though they're not his limbs, he's still able to gain functionality of them through a very similar means. <laughs> That's a interesting reference there. I wonder how many people. Uh, who are fans of the channel and fans of uh, our casting are actually also Rick and Morty fans. I'm sure that's there's quite a bit of crossover. There's a bit of crossover. I'm sure there's a bit of crossover there. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, with this Neuralink thing, that's that's like the ultimate maybe goal in the future, you know, something like that. But uh, for now, you know, being able to control some things on a screen, uh, it, Big step. It, it feels so mundane to us, right? It just, it's not though really for just, them for yeah. them it's so huge it's massive it's massive for them they're instant life improvement like tenfold life improvement because they can actually right. do things that uh you know instead of just sitting and watching tv or uh just talking you know like they can actually manipulate objects they can manipulate electronics just incredible they can they can stay up late and play games again. You know, I mean, there's so imagine if you at home, imagine you're a gamer, right? Probably, presumably, one you're a gamer, and now imagine you suddenly can't play games for a whole year, not allowed to play any games. You're kind of just like stuck in a chair, can't do shit. Unless people have a lot of compassion for you, you're pretty much fucked, all right? And now someone comes along and goes, oh, by the way, little 
look, five minutes, five months time, a little bit of brain surgery, a little bit of tests, a little bit of interviews, and then suddenly we can put this thing in your head and you can play games all night again. I mean, that's like crazy to these guys. That's like, that's not even money. That's just like, you know, heaven. Well, after you've been through that long, we're not able to have any kind of functionality that you would like to have to suddenly be able to be like, oh yeah, just stay up for eight hours playing games all night if you want. What? That's going to be crazy for these guys. Yeah. And I mean, this could also eventually be used to do work as well, right? If you're able to work online, if you are able to code or something mm. like that, or do some sort of, um, you know, online work, um, you know, you might hire somebody in the future and you not even know that they're a paraplegic. It turns out that, you know, they're doing everything through. Uh, and they might like, be hell a lot more capable than people that are showing up walking around, you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe it just depends on, um, depends on the technology and, uh, yeah, their, their own intelligence. I think that, I mean, that, that's, that's huge, right? These paraplegic people for basically ever, if you're a paraplegic, you're basically, you're reliant on everyone else for the entirety of your life, for the rest of your life. Maybe there is a, a world in which you know, a paraplegic person, even if they uh, don't have like a really good f family support structure, they could, you know, work, mm -hmm. make money and pay for people to, uh, you know, take care of some of their needs so that they can they can live, you know, that would be amazing. It would be amazing. And honestly, like there's a lot about this stuff that gets my heart all warm and fuzzy, though being the nature of the podcast i also have some reservations and also some things i want to devil's advocate and give a little pushback on and you know talk a little bit about like the humanist versus transhumanist uh angles a little bit because there is some could think there's some lines of concern here as well right mm. like this isn't all like sunshine and rainbows either sure 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 well my th first thought when i was watching the <laughs> When I was watching the Neuralink presentation, I was like, wow, they're going to use that for StarCraft someday. I bet you. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> imagine, imagine, imagine someone oh, can man. use, can use Neuralink to control their mouse and then they can use both hands on the keyboard to macro. Oh man, how crazy would that be? Dude, I bet, I bet I someday there there's a... going to be Neuralink in a tournament with Neuralink for StarCraft. Yeah, there's a game, I think, uh, it might be Red Alert 2 or something. I think there's a, it might be Yuri. There's a character in it. Well, not Yuri, but there's a, a, a unit in the game, maybe. That, and the line is, um, like when you click on the unit, it's like a voice line. I think his, his voice line is, the mind is quicker than the eye. And that's what I thought of when I was like watching this stuff. I was thinking to myself, hang on a minute. Like, really? This is what Elon Musk has been talking about for a long time. He's been talking about like the limitation of the bandwidth of like your mm. so-called meat sticks, your fingers and stuff. And like really we've got these like quantum computers between our ears in terms of like what our brains are capable of right mm -hmm. so if we are able to somehow directly interface with the world using our brain someone that's even remotely intelligent is going to be all kinds of like omniscient you know what i mean mm. potentially with the tech gets developed enough like that's crazy what that could potentially unlock and does give me a little bit cause for alarm in terms of maybe only the elite get access to like the most up-to-date you know generation so like they're, they're like they're like ahead of the curve so they've got like access to the newer generations before like the the wider consumers so they've got an advantage because like you know they're processing things better or what have you that's like one angle of concern but there's also a lot of others that i want to get into eventually mm, yeah no, I, I can i can see that this cause for concern but i you could probably say the same thing about like cars or something like that too right like when cars say it's the same running. thing though like <laughs> I would not, say no, it's a bit apples and oranges. Like a car gets you from point A to point B, regardless of how flashy it is and mm -hmm. like how fuel efficient it is, right? Maybe it helps you save some money if you're like saving on gas or what have you, but it's not going to help you like analyze the stock market better. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm just saying like that uh, people get, you know, the richer people get the cars first, right? And then they get the better, best right. of the best cars. So they're able to get where they want to go faster than everybody else right which is a big advantage but um yeah but i think this is even eventually like a, everybody just... ha can afford a car right For pretty right, much everyone right. has one they have something you know maybe it's not the fastest car in the world but they can still get what they need 
you know what I mean? But yeah, point B kind it, of thing. yeah, but it, it does make a difference. Like it, we are talking about apples and oranges. There's no really good comparison. It's like comparing comparing computers to like comparing AI yeah. or so, AI or something like that. You know, where it's like the 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 future functionality of like a really really strong AI or really powerful AI is like just light years mm. different, just orders of magnitude different than you know just your typical computer, right? Like. Right, it's crazy. Well, this stuff is this stuff is so groundbreaking that there's mm -hmm. no experts on it. All expert means is someone that is like well versed on what has been before. Mm -hmm. Like he's like he's knowledgeable on the the industry and what has happened up until in that point, but not beyond that. Right, he's not a fortune teller. Mm -hmm. So this is the problem: is there's no experts in this field. It's a completely new field. Like there's people like Elon Musk, and there's lots of really intelligent scientists and engineers working for him that are way more qualified to talk about it than saying and i however even they don't like know the full extent of what they're talking about because they haven't done it yet like everything is still fresh to them as well yeah they don't know where the technology is going yeah what, what's the next breakthrough for sure it's kind of it's both ex it's exceedingly exciting and horrifically terrifying at the same time you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah this is it's like a Black Mirror episode, you know? Like, wow. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine that that's going to be the technology in the future. It's so cool, but also at the same time, like, wow, that's going to fuck. This is going to be a, a big problem. Like, we can see some, we could see some bumps coming down in the road, but of course, we yeah. have to, we have to give, you know, some, um, some credence to the idea that yeah we just don't know like we can try to predict bumps in the road right we can try to predict that the things are going to go wrong or things are going to go right we can't we can't really predict the future well there's though. there's two attitudes we could uh, there's a few but to simplify mm -hmm. there's a few attitudes we can take of all this stuff with ai with Neuralink and all this stuff we can have the attitude of like ah we got to be really careful and like really regulate this stuff and make sure it doesn't get too crazy and make sure there's not like a huge war between transhumanists and like human purists that like you know don't want to assimilate with technology and they want to remain pure to humans and the other side want to transform into cyborgs kind of thing and it's like mm -hmm. a whole religious war between like technology versus spirituality or whatever um anything's possible but uh, I, you could have the attitude of the opposite where it's like hang on a minute we've already passed through a few great filters as humanity we haven't blown each other up with nukes yet we haven't died off to like ice ages or famines yet the you know the climate change hasn't completely ruined us yet blah, blah, blah. rather than like worrying about all these potential pitfalls like ai and all these other things that could devastate us why not just go full steam ahead with the assumption that if we're going to make it we're going to make it and if we don't we don't and we just want to cross through as many filters as possible to kind of like have the the highest rate of advancement and the highest rate of success like kind of like playing from behind in starcraft with like okay if we're going to make it out of this we have to play a certain way we can't like try and play too careful because that won't be enough even if we do have a chance at winning we have to just go like all in and just hope for the best and hope the stars align kind of thing it's like mm. two ways we can think about this yeah i mean the smartest people in the world a lot of them are uh, preaching for caution right they're preaching to like do the cautious response and like slow things down and take you know extra care with regulation and stuff i'm not i'm not smart enough to to know what's the right choice but, i don't um, think even if we do go cautiously we can keep it in the box is the mm. i think the argument that could be made here is like well hang on a minute even if we do err on the side of caution we can't control all the state actors in the world we can't police every individual entity like you can slow it down with regulations and what have you like maybe Elon Musk didn't get FDA approved or what have you to do do this first implant or what, you know slow this progress down and stuff like this. Mm. But um, you can't stop that indefinitely. Like, what if like China or Russia or something do it like state funded and private, and you don't even know about it until it's like already been done. Right. And this 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 kind of thing could already be occurring around the world, and it's even possible that technology technology is being rapidly advanced commercially and to the public now that you know it's kind of like the brakes are coming off now that things are ramping up and countries like china and russia like have much more to play for and like they don't need to use conventional warfare anymore they need to rely on nuclear warfare anymore there's economic warfare there's cyber warfare there's all kinds of like propaganda and other tools that can be used to leverage against your foe 
in this day and age. So you don't even need to worry about that kind of conventional mindset anymore. There's so many different ways you can interact with, with the world stage. And I think that maybe that's why we're seeing such a sudden ramping in like this technology recently, because it's like the brakes have come off because it's like now it's like all hands on deck because the first who gets the AI, the first who gets these implants going is probably going to be like setting the pace for the rest of the world going forward. Yeah, the cyber warfare thing is um, is massive. And that's I, the biggest fear, I think, is that AI will be used for those Absolutely. type of means. As a first, like the first thing that they're going to do is try to take over their the opponent's systems, you know, America's systems or whatever, people in the West systems. To try to take over everything, give, well, get control, well, as much control as possible. If you have a sophisticated enough general AI that's able to catch incoming threats and deal with them in real time without any human intervention, that gives you like a green light to do whatever you want to your opponent as well. Like think of it as like, if you can nuke your enemy and he can't nuke you because you can shoot down his nukes, like you, you have total leverage over him, right? The same way in cyber warfare, if you're able to attack someone's infrastructure through cyber means and he can't attack you because you've got this like ai defense grid that like will just lock down any attempted threat and like be, be able to like either shut down the systems to prevent any kind of catastrophe or some kind of countermeasure that's like doesn't re rely on like human implementation or human intervention so it's purely automated and in real time so it's like super quick reaction speed even the best hackers in the world would then start struggling. And that's the issue right now. In cyber warfare, it's much easier to attack than defend, but AI could change that a lot. Mm, maybe. Yeah, it's uh, hard to see where it's going, man. It's really hard to see where it's going, but um, maybe you're right. Like, maybe it's time to just, like, you know, instead of worrying about opening the box, just open it and unpack it, put up all the things on the wall, you know, set up the furniture. It's like facing your demons, maybe. <clears throat> and like rather than like trying to run from the apart. demons yeah yeah <laughs> but, integrate I mean, that into might, the world that might be the only play in terms of like because i don't think we have the ingenuity or the intelligence or the discipline or anything to be able to keep it in the box and to, to regulate it and to have any kind of control over it and i think any inclination that we do is nothing short of arrogance it's happening so fast now, man. It's um, it's blowing me away every time I see like new AI tools coming out, and uh, how quickly they're developing is uh, it's scary. It is scary. But we talked a lot That's about AI. We, know about. we talked a lot about AI uh, last episode. So let, let's talk a bit more about Neuralink, man. And uh, I think you, sure. sa you said some more, you had some other fears about Neuralink that I thought was interesting. Okay, so there's some deep philosophical horrific things to consider with this stuff. On the one hand, it's beautiful that someone who's paraplegic can regain functionality of their limbs again in the sense of, as far as they're concerned, they're interacting with the world in a more normal way in the sense of like as far as they're concerned it feels like their fingers are still moving and they're still thinking about using their hand to do those things you could argue that they're not really doing that they're just training their brain to align those things so because they train their brain to think of clicking with the action of raising their finger or what have you that's causing that bridge to like give that phantom sensation of using their finger whenever they try to do the action but that's irrelevant alignment and what have you that's completely irrelevant what is what is a factor what is relevant is, is the fact that while they're doing that, they're of the illusion that they are the ones that are controlling that, but it's not, it's still the implant. And if the implant is set up in such a way that whenever it electrically signals your body to do something or to do an action on screen, if it creates that same stimulation in your brain that it feels like your fingers moving, it feels like you're making that choice, you will, it's an issue of discernment. You will no longer have the autonomy or the ability to discern whether or not that was you doing that or the implant. And that opens up the door for like, say, hackers to like make you do something about you realizing it's you doing it. Or maybe you're, you're on Amazon like shopping and you're buying something you don't actually want to buy, but somehow the implant is like kind of tricked you into thinking you did want to buy it. And it kind of is a very like a, like a black mirror thing of like not really having a sense of freedom and autonomy anymore. Cause you never can know for sure if it's actually you wanting to do these things or if it's somehow the implant implant, like influencing you. 
yeah it'd be interesting in the future maybe they have like regulations where it's like okay the neural link can only receive signals it can't send signals to your brain and they like have fda approved like oh we're, we you know we're checking all of them making sure that they're not able to send signals and maybe there's certain you know off-market implants yeah, that are like always find a loophole yeah uh, you know they're adding in these like extra functionalities to where they can maybe like stimulate your brain in certain ways and uh you know people want to buy into that because then they can like improve their mood or whatever or like help themselves uh you know stay more disciplined or something i i, I don't know what you could what what is even possible but like i don't know what's possible with the Neuralink if you if you've got like a direct connection to your brain and the Neuralink is figuring you out slowly right like you're you're giving it more information about what the signals in your brain are actually saying right like each signal represents a movement or a thought or a feeling uh and the the neural link is slowly like deciphering what those are and then if it's able to send signals back into your brain then maybe you can eliminate things like depression you know what i mean like every time a yeah. signal for like this negative emotion comes into your brain the neural link like counters it and sends a signal into your brain for a positive emotion and kind of like shuts down your depression but, you know what i mean like those type of things are, this are totally is, possible but this is this is also totally strange as well the, 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 there'll be a huge counter movement to this of people that are like say purists or like mm -hmm. humanists and then they will say well hang on a minute whoa 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 you want to play god and like simulate your emotions and like completely rewrite so what happens if like you lose a family member and you're feeling really depressed about it and suddenly your implant like makes you feel not too bad about it like you're take you're like ridding yourself of like a, an authentic human experience potentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of strangeness to this and there will be a lot of people that are like yeah man jack me in like hook me up i want to start like you know buying stuff with my mind i want to play games with my mind man like telekinesis let's go dude you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. they're gonna be all over there but there'll be a lot of people that are really against it and i think that this could be another form of division form of culture war form of control form of like another layer of the matrix being just bestowed upon us and could potentially be devastating as well as exciting yeah imagine the the conspiracy theories as well like people oh yeah are gonna be going nutty you know your implants this is the mark of the beast you. and yeah. stuff yeah 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 <laughs> It'll yeah. be all about that stuff, for sure. And, and there's good reason for it as well, because this is very scary stuff. And it doesn't matter what persuasion you are, if you're religious, if you're a bit of a conspiracy theory guy, it doesn't really matter. Like, you're right to be concerned. And whatever lens you look at this, like in terms of like, oh, this isn't, this is like playing God or like, this isn't right in terms of like, this is going to cause like economic devastation or what have you, or like more like imbalances in society because like the, the, the elite and the wealthy will have access to the better technology or what have you. Like there's so many angles you can look at this, but you're right to be skeptical and you're right to be fearful and you're right. Like you, you it's like we talked about in the previous episode about that quote from small soldiers, like, you know, you scared good. Like you, sh you know, we're all scared. You'd have to be crazy not to be scared. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um it it is a frightening time to be alive, man. It's a scary time to be alive, but uh also a very exciting time to be alive. And I, I think a lot of the fears that we've had over the years have been uh, unwarranted, you know, like things that people were really afraid about with video games, you know, making everyone violent or like People were afraid of, you know, Y2K, the internet was going to like break down and people are afraid of all kinds of different things. But it's usually these sort of underlying issues um, that have like, difficult consequences, bad consequences, but are not like um, super revolutionary. For example, like People were really afraid of the internet and uh, what it was going to do for jobs. And it was going to take away tons of jobs and computers were going to you know, ruin the economy and take away everybody's jobs. It's just kind of made more people more efficient. But at mm -hmm. the same time, it's given people access to like unlimited uh, sexual content. And like there's tons of porn that everyone can watch and there, you know, you can... Uh, creep on other people con constantly or connected to social media all the time. And it's kind of like slowly degraded people's ability to socialize with each other. 
in like a weird right. nefarious way do you know what i mean where it's like i know exactly what you mean it's sort of like it, it's it's more it, it's it seems just like it's connection just, through connection it's like creepy creepy consequences like creepy nefarious consequences that slowly like creep in uh rather than just like a sudden switch you know what i mean it, right it's oh, like exactly what you mean. It, it really like improves everything immediately but then like those extra little tailing consequences slowly and creep in with and we're being engineered to be psychopathic where we we're more concerned about that short-term gain rather than those like long-term relationships that we're mo losing out on that's mm -hmm. like Jordan Peterson would say that's like the definition of psychopathy, being more like short-term gain oriented and less like long-term relationship oriented. That's like you could argue is a definition of um, psychopathy, or at least in some people's opinion. Mm. So, I mean, I'm not too too worried about like the major consequence. I'm not worried about like a Terminator type situation. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not worried about. AI turning around and nuking the whole planet, you know, like I think that uh, this is going to vastly improve a lot of our lives. The the Neuralink implants going to improve a lot of people's lives. It's going to save a lot of people from a lot of desperate situations like being a paraplegic, that type of thing. Um, it might even cure a lot of different mental illnesses, like I was saying, the the depression problem, it right? Stop there. But with those, uh, you know positives there's going to be slow creeping negative effects yeah. on the entire society and this is the problem. As well. i think this is even more nefarious because it'll be done under the guise of this altruistic like we're going to help all the paraplegic people in the world and i think that's super great but it won't stop there will it it'll be it'll be released to the consumer market everyone will want to have it we'll all be jacked into the matrix essentially it's interesting yeah i i mean really jacked into the matrix <laughs> it's it's kind of funny that uh in the matrix there's like this massive core that, that like locks into your brain right and then we get to 2024 and it's like a tiny little chip like microscopic that just plays into your brain <laughs> like dude yeah it's way less, uh, smaller than you would ever less imagine intrusive yeah it's yeah, less intrusive less right intrusive, even more like yeah. oh that's not too bad that's not too bad that's not too bad <laughs> i could get that done i could get that done yeah i I remember watching the matrix for the first time and watching the that giant like spike come out of the back of the dude's head like, that would turn people off right most people would then be turned off to the idea, right? If that was the case, you had to like stick this massive spike into the back of your head. A lot less people are going to be down for that. But a little tiny chip in your head? Hmm, not so bad. Sign me up for the Mark of the Beast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it is very funny. Um, just thinking back, like all the different technologies that people imagine for the future and the size difference, right? They always think that the things are going to be way bigger than they actually are. Um, we're capable mm -hmm. of making things so incredibly small now, right? Like, it's, well, uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, computers used to take up the size of a whole room, you exactly, know what I mean? Exactly, exactly, right? So they think about a, you know, there's like a science fiction movie where there's a supercomputer and it's this massive structure, like a whole building or something like that. No, no yeah. bro. <laughs> Do you know what I also think would be really cool, though, is mm. like even though we miniaturize technology, what if there's like an alien race out there that has miniaturized their technology so much where it's like these little tiny chips, they don't need like big structures. But despite that, there's still like entire planets where it's just like covered in technology. Like the entire planet is just dedicated to like being one big supercomputer. You know what I'm saying? That's funny that you say that. Um, I know we were talking about the three body problem which is a great new show, guys, if you haven't seen it on Netflix. Don't spoil it. I've only seen, like, one episode. <laughs> <laughs> you still haven't watched it anymore, hey? Okay. No, I'm watching it with my cousin once a week, so, like, each podcast I would have seen one more episode, basically. Right. Well, in that show, the aliens take the miniaturization of technology to another level that's uh, really insane. So you're going to look forward to that, but it's... um. Yeah, there's uh, okay. There's there's different levels. I'm sure if there's an alien race out there that was truly thousands of years in advance of us, um, I mean, well, depending on how far away they are, 
if they, like if they're a thousand light years away, then mm -hmm. it means it takes a thousand years for the light to reach us. So, if by if if at the moment we look at them and they're two thousand years in advance of us, they're actually three thousand years in advance mm -hmm. for us because we're looking at them from the past thousand years ago. I'm just saying, if they are a thousand years in advance from us, uh, their technology would look like magic, right? That's oh that's god, yeah, saying. oh yeah, like indis indistinguishable from magic. Even if it was like probably a few hundred years it would, to us, it would probably be like Bleh. yeah, it. That's the the beauty of that that TV show, right? Is um, everything that they're doing looks like magic. There's so much like magic going on, and uh, the technology behind it is secret. So it's like it would it stuff... would really seem like magic. Now, let's get a little bit conspiracy theorist. Do you think that that kind of stuff is happening in the world right now, where they're they're working on some crazy stuff and like? it would be the industry as far as we're concerned we might consider it magic i'm talking about those like black budget like military projects where like trillions of dollars go missing from the pentagon and like you know get sucked up by these like really like non-disclosed things where they're building like i don't know like iron man suits and god knows what mm. as prototypes for like future potential use obviously like they're not going to be ready for like military use right now but they're like prototyping stuff that's like 50 years in advance of modern day tech i lean towards saying yes but at the same time i'm also almost so cynical i feel like it's just corruption like these black budget programs they're just taking they're just taking money and just draining it out i feel like they're not even producing anything worthwhile that they're talking just up be... to pure corruption only yeah, I'm saying like they they might be working on a few things, but in my cynical brain, like I'm thinking that it's mostly just corruption. But the the mm -hmm. thing is, we'll never know unless there's a big war, right? If there's a big war, then all of the toys come out. You know what I mean? Like everything they've been working on is gonna pop right. to the front, and we're just gonna be mesmerized. That that's what could be scary, capable. dude. Like like there might be things happening that we can't even explain because mm -hmm. we don't even know what's going on. Like all of a sudden the sky is a different color or something. We're like, what? Mm. And like, or like all of a sudden, like, you know, planes just like fall out the sky or something because they're being like ECM jammed from like hundreds of miles away or something. You know what I mean? Mm. Like tens of thousands of troops just suddenly like appear in your country. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. They've got like what? underground <laughs> like tunnels that you mm. never even knew about or something. Well, like, they, they've got like some sort of portal technology or something. Yeah, where they can, who knows, like, man? Move through an extra dimension. <laughs> I mean, it does sound like something out of Stargate or something, but I mean, who the fuck knows, man? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like a stealth bomber that like dimensionally shifts. So you can't even, it's not even literally on this plane of existence. It just appears in the sky. Sounds like some like Eve Online tactics where you're like messing with the game code to like not even show up on the heads up display, but you're still able to like bomb the shit out of someone. Yeah, I don't know, man. I have no idea. Like uh instead of like a bomb that's like a EMP, it's like a AI bomb where it just like infects everything that it it within a certain range of, of its like signal, you know, they just send in a bomb that just shoots like a basically like a Wi-Fi signal out to everything and just infects everything and turns it against whatever uh, owners are using. Mm. Yeah. I think the most cunning the most cunning way would be like um, like tricking like FDA and those kinds of entities by like you don't necessarily like put poison in someone's food per se but like so you put the ingredients for poison in, in the food chain like you say in the water supply there's one chemical and in this particular brand of food there's this other chemical they're completely innate on their own but when combined in the stomach can cause a certain reaction kind of thing like, there's so many like creative ways you could do to like fuck with a country or something you don't have to like bomb them you know what i mean there's so many yeah, interesting sure. creative ways you could do sure thing yeah Absolutely. And those those um organizations, those regulatory organizations are so full of holes and corruption. It's uh would would be relatively simple, I think, to slip something like that by. Just grease a few palms or like you know, make things a little bit too difficult to understand the you mm. know, the complexity of the plan. And then they're just gonna completely like 
not even realize what's happening. While we're on this particular vein, I recommend anyone listening right now, including you, saying there's a show called Utopia. It's the British version, not the American remake. Do not watch the American remake, okay, guys? Even if you like the original British one, do not watch the American remake. It's not like the American Office, okay? It's terrible. But the British original one, I think from 2013 or something, wow, watch that. Like a very interesting show, kind of in the same theme of what we're talking about here. Hmm. All right, Utopia. Check it out. Utopia. Mm-hmm. It's weird when reality starts to look like science fiction, man. Very strange. Yeah, very, very strange. But I mean, sometimes reality is stranger than fiction, I find. So you're getting the Neuralink implant? <laughs> I don't want to declare my allegiance just yet, Sam. Where's the fun in that? Bro, if you don't get it, I'm going to whoop you at StarCraft. <laughs> you want to bet? I might still beat you <laughs> with my, my biological man body. Just just nothing born and bred here in Zion kind of attitude, <laughs> you know? Don't need no help. <laughs> the, 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 the speed that I'm going to be able to achieve with that Neuralink software, man. Well, I'm hoping that your base speed is slow enough that even with the help of the Neuralink, we'll be about <laughs> even still. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I I just I love the idea of having like a, a Neuralink uh, Starcraft tournament in the future. Yeah, uh, man. I mean, the, wouldn't it be interesting if like it gets divided though? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like like in the same way like there's like a, a Paralympics. Like what if there's like a Neuralink kind of comp like like there's some gamers that compete as Neuralink gamers and some people that are like you know non. You have Neuralink gamers, and you have to divide the categories. So you have like a pure human category and a, like a Neuralink category. Yeah, that might be possible. That might be possible. If it's that much uh, of a difference between the the ability to play, um, where like you have to like mouse users and Neuralink users, you know. Yeah, um, I'm because... curious how how that will translate because mm -hmm. there might be it might be that like say certain things like macro would be easier in StarCraft with Neuralink, but it also might be the opposite is like it's harder to micro using that interface and actually the old fashioned keyboard and mouse is like slightly better for like precise control. If you know what I'm saying, mm, might be, might be. I don't know what where we're gonna get with that technology, but could be interesting someday in the future. Yeah, it could be. Int I mean, it would be pretty amazing if it was just a person. Like literally just sitting in front of a computer playing StarCraft with their brain, even if they're, they're not using <laughs> a keyboard at all, that would that would just be surreal. And just imagine that, like, a a game that was created at the birth of the internet, basically, right at the yeah. very earliest stages of the internet, and then fifty six K modem times, and it's it survived and still played all the way through it until people can play with their brain. <laughs> they just play. With, just totally with the Neuralink interface, that would be so insane. Uh, um, kind of hilarious, yeah, because it'd be like it'd be like um, a coming together of two um, shifts and eras, if you know what I'm saying, like two mm -hmm. technological shifts. You know what I mean? Yeah, we it'd lived, we lived through it. We lived through it. We witnessed it. That would be, uh, yeah. I, yeah, witness me, Sam. Witness and, me. And then is this the Mad Max type <clears throat> shit? We'll we'll cast that game, and it'll be like the sem <laughs> the seminal moment. That'll be like the we'll cast the game using using Neuralink. <laughs> or you'll love Neuralink, and I won't. And we'll do like see who's the better caster. <laughs> <laughs> How is Neuralink gonna help with your casting? No, that's what I'm saying. I will cast without Neuralink, and you cast with Neuralink. Yeah, but it doesn't it doesn't have any effect on your ability to speak, does it? Not, not right now necessarily, but who knows? Maybe you'll be able to like use your mind to like look up game statistics while we're playing or something. <laughs> who knows? Right. Yeah. That's... You're like looking up the player statistics while we're casting, and you're like, oh, by the way, like three games ago, this happened. Like, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? How are you getting that? Yeah, I, I think I think that's the carrot that gets people to start like receiving information from Neuralink as well, right? Like at first, it'll just be like, okay, I only want Neuralink to take Interface. information from my body like i'll i'll right. give it information and then it it reacts in the world you know what i mean like i can mm -hmm. use neuralink to use my computer but like once you start getting information from neuralink in directly downloaded into your brain um 
you know, you'll be able a lot to, of incentives for that. Yeah, you'll be able to look things up and immediately get the information into your brain. That is, I think, the, the thing that opens Saying, the door to people actually one, wanting, in, you know, the other way, the other direction of in, input, and then it's like really opening up the door to a lot of shit. Well, one step further, say, and imagine like future generations of this tech, and it's, it is like the Matrix in the sense of like you can download Kung Fu into your body, mm. where it's like you can just like get the Neuralink to tell your body how to move to like do a high kick or something. And like you can get the Neuralink to like teach you the range of motion you need to actually do these things. And then suddenly you can like learn Kung Fu interfacing through the Neuralink, even though you've never done a lesson in your life. Well, I always, I, I've had this thought in my head for a long time actually is like how amazing would it be uh, from a, like an entertainment point of view if we could uh, have someone with Neuralink do something really amazing like for example um, do a uh, let, let, let's let's give a good example like um, snowboard at the Olympics you know what I mean like do all the flips and shit and like really cool stuff with the Neuralink implant inside and the Neuralink like right. downloads all the information of what that feels like to do and then that. You can experience that. Yeah. And then you doing it. Yeah. You can at home be like, let me just uh, sit back and just feel what it feels like to do that. And you just totally have that experience. Which is another strange thing because we might get to a point where we're no longer having our own experiences anymore. Right. Because the experiences that we um, that we can get on our own are so like mm. mundane in comparison to you could just download the experience of being like a a fighter in Syria or something, or you can download See what the it feels like to be a DJ or something. Yeah. yeah, a DJ at like a massive concert or a, you know, like any DJ, or, but or a chat DJ, or, someone yeah. that's like crazy good as well, like someone that can probably do it better than you could if you tried to do it yourself. So it's like, why would I bother trying to do it myself? I can just like jack into this guy who's like already amazing, right? Or drive, drive like F one or something, uh, and you can just experience what driving in in the F one uh, race would feel people like. People would be all about that, right? Yeah. There's no, there's there's such a tiny fraction of people on the planet that can even handle driving with those G forces and not mm -hmm. like freak out with like how quick reaction speed they need, like fighter pilot type shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think the the game or movie that really captured that idea the best was Cyberpunk, right? Like you're. But they they only did it yeah. for like there was like a, they were trading in like black market videos like that where it was like a, yeah, well, like a cool. snuff well, film again? I can't remember it was brain dance that's what it was brain brain dance, dance. yeah brain dance yeah and that's kind of that's what worries me is that we're we're moving into a very dystopian cyberpunk kind of future where mm. it's going to be very high tech low life and I'm hoping it's not going to be as low life as it is in these games and other worlds that have been foreseen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like, man. I, I feel like in, in one sense, it's very nice, useful. Um, it's going to improve a lot of people's lives, but at the same time, there's those nefarious consequences, right? There's like those creeping, those creeping issues that are going to slowly get All into right. our society. Like, yes. Um, yeah. The people are um enjoying their lives a lot more because they have all these cool experience they can you know not everyone can go to the moon do you know what i mean but you could download no. the the, the experience. Neuralink experience of going to the moon from a astronaut perspective and then actually feel like you did it and that would be insanely beneficial like it's so cool um right for for you to just be able to download that and get that but then at the same time like maybe people are going out less and enjoying life less you know because they're just at home it'll doing ruin the novelty though right mm. it'll ruin the novelty of everything everything will be mundane it'll be like oh going on like chilling like, like in the um, the cyberpunk anime i don't know if you ever saw the street runners anime version yeah. of that mm -hmm. but um do you remember like when they're like just chilling on the moon looking at the earth kind of thing edge runner sorry do you remember they were like chilling on the moon looking at the earth kind of thing it like that will even though that would like mesmerize us right now, mm. it might become a thing that's like completely mundane and actually just like chilling out with your buddy after work kind of thing. Maybe, maybe. I don't it know. Lose a lot of novelty. It's hard to say what's uh, going to happen, man. 
I don't know what I would do if I was, uh, you know, capable of having that technology. If I had the option of just like right now, uh, downloading a, a VR, basically like a, a cyberpunk brain dance of whatever experiences that I would I would want. What would I do with that? You know, would I be sitting sitting here doing that for twelve hours straight? You know, maybe I would. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't even want to be part of reality. That's the thing, right? You wouldn't have to. You could just like do it, do whatever you wanted from your basement. Like basement dwelling will be even more, even more prevalent. It would get to the point where you don't even have to leave your house, and you can just get everything you need delivered to you, and just have like a matrix esque experience. Yeah, that's wild. I can't imagine, but. And not everyone will do that, though. There'll be like some people that are like just jacked in doing that, like day to day, and they they kind of live in that virtual world type thing. But there'll be some humanists that don't do that, and that's what will cause a shift and a culture war, as well as a spiritual war, as well as a an actual war potentially between wonder, humanists and transhumanists. I wonder. Yeah. Well, there might not be. And very the transhumanists many... will win. <laughs> What are they? There'll be more technologically advanced. What are they fighting over, though? Exactly. The spirituality, because you could argue that you're basically going to become a machine at that rate. Like you will lose your humanity eventually. You won't be a human anymore, and there's no, you know, it, they would argue that it's like akin to selling your soul, or literally like giving up your soul and replacing it with a machine. And then you have to worry about immortalization. So. Right now, one thing that protects us from tyranny is the fact that these tyrants can die. Hitler can die. These, these these horrible people can die, and like you'll be free of them eventually. Maybe you won't escape them immediately because you have to deal with their offspring or something and the future generations that they have. But eventually, you have this like safety net of eventually one of those motherfuckers is going to die, and you're going to be okay again. And that will disappear if there's any kind of life extension or immortalization because of this transhumanist shit so then eventually some guy gets power and maybe he's like some ceo of like some super corporation that has the governments in his pockets and the, now the governments just exist to extract money from the people and put it into his hands and he has total like control over like at least that part of the world and he can just subjugate and like oppress the people and like for not just his lifetime but potentially like multiple generations of their lifetimes because he lives forever and they don't Maybe, maybe, yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like um, if you're a humanist and you don't want to have the the Neuralink um, in your brain, then I, I don't see any reason. Like, are you going to fight the people who want Neuralink so that, that they can't have it? I feel like it's that's a losing that they, battle. It's, 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 it's not that they they might... It depends on how society is structured, right? If we move towards like a more socialist type deal where it's like even though we've got ai even though we've got neural links we're still gonna like try and like help lift up people a little bit then maybe not but that won't happen probably what will happen is like the people with the technology will get all the wealth the elites with the technology and then the next who will have the next amount of wealth will be the people the, the, the you know the working man who also has neural link and the people without Neuralink won't be able to compete. So they'll be bled out on the market, won't be able to compete with the market, and they'll be struggling for resources, both financially and actual resources of food and shelter and what have you. Might even become like like such an issue that they feel like they have to fight because they're being bled out of existence because they just can't compete with like the the new standards of like the the average worker is now like so advanced compared to a biological human that they're just being completely wiped out in the market and can't even like earn enough food to live. It's a weird dichotomy. It's a strange thing that's happened in our uh, society that makes me feel like you might be right, is that uh, as technologies continue to grow and become more and more powerful, uh, people have become way more efficient at creating uh, value. You know, the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the efficiency of one worker has gone up tenfold in the past hundred years, but um, the the actual like living standard of a regular person has kind of dropped down in the past twenty years, right? It's kind of gone 
mm. relative, they're, they're wealthier. The, the working class is wealthier than the people of that time. But we're talking in relative terms, though, right? The disparity of wealth is what you were talking about. I don't really care about wealth disparity. I care about like what's the lowest standard of living. You know what I mean? Like mm. the regular person, the average person, are they better off or are they worse off than? Well, they're better the off in the sense they have like access to clean drinking water and they have electricity and heating and stuff, right? Like well, they some had things. Those things twenty years ago too, right? That's kind of what I'm saying. They have a higher living standard, but relative to what the wealthiest had back then because here's the thing like a wealthy guy a few hundred years ago would be like thinking that your living room with your tv and lights are like magic right mm -hmm. so but today's standards that's considered like the median or the the nominal thing to have if you've got a little bit of money it's not too weird to have a tv and lights and heating and stuff right if you've got a little bit of money mm -hmm. So as long as you have lights, power, food, those types of basic essentials, internet, those type of things, I think that um, like there's not going to be a reason for people to to fight the powerful, you know, the, the, the neuralink people. To like have initially, they will have access to those things, like like we have now. Like we're being distracted with a, a few wants, so. You're going to go along with the ride because there's enough things to, to incentivize you. Like you can still go down to the store and like grab some coffee, grab whatever you want, any treats that you want to kind of satisfy your ego and keep you placated and like, you know, part of the system. There's enough there. There's enough carrot there that you're not going to mind that like stick in the background. And it's kind of like the, the frog in the water analogy where if you put the frog in the water and very slowly bring the water to boil, the frog will not notice the change in temperature and will eventually be boiled. Whereas if you put the frog in the hot water all at once, it will notice and get out and save itself. And we are that frog right now being slowly brought to the boil and we're simmering a little bit right now. We're slowly being brought up to that boiling point and we've not yet reached it and we think we're totally fine. We notice the water's getting a little warm, but we're not concerned yet. I don't think we're going to get concerned quick enough. I think there might be a case in the future with um, transhumanists and humanists, people who are accepting Neuralink and people who reject it, where there's actually going to be like a lot more people who are accepting of Neuralink and then that demographic is going to like shift slowly over time where like people who accept Neuralink are going to have less kids they're like gonna you know live less in the real world mm. and live more in the digital world and have you know less interactions with r real people and thus you know have less relationships have less uh, uh sex have less children and then the people who are uh humanists who don't except those things will uh, basically dominate in terms of reproduction and eventually over you know have more there'll be more regular humanists than humanists it's kind of like a natural progression but i think for a long time it'll probably be dominated by the transhumanists it's just it's 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 really <laughs> it's strange to think about that um you know it, all over the world, basically, even at the level of technology we have now, mm -hmm. birth rates are declining, right? Yeah. We don't have Neuralink yet, but birth rates are falling. Is at all time low. And you can think of like people who are living in low, uh, you know, th these, these countries that are not considered technologically advanced um, are having still high birth rates and outnumbering the people in the, the high technology areas, right? But uh, just imagine that on steroids, once Neuralink and everything is right. established, right? If, if what we are talking about ever comes to pass, where Neuralink is able to feed your brain information and uh, you can do things like have the, the brain dance, that type of stuff, uh, how much of an impact that's going to have in the same direction as what we already have is having that impact, right? Not only that, but they might like potentially even regulate childbirth in the future where it, it could be done under the guise of like, oh, well, everyone's like so incapable of being good parents because you're also like stuck in your mindlessly self-indulged like brain dance world that to have kids, you now have to like go through like official capacities that are going to monitor the process and like make sure you're eligible first and blah, blah, blah. make it even eat harder to have kids. Mm. You know what I mean? 
well, you know, in China right now, they're forcing people to have kids. They're saying that you it's like a two-child minimum that you have to have children. <laughs> two-child minimum? Yeah, that could be the, the future, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, they did kind of shoot themselves in the foot with the one-child policy going on for as long as it did, I think, especially yeah. because it encouraged them because they only had access sex to one they'd much prefer the boys as well so there's a lot of uh girls that got shafted in the that system over there i'm not going to talk too much about it it's a little bit depressing but mm. yeah yeah the the one child system was uh or one child policy was absolutely devastating and uh, completely short-sighted but that's pretty much everything that communism does is uh, incredibly short-sighted and way too heavy-handed. Yeah, I mean, I would love to go into the political debate about communism, but maybe we should save that for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. But yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a little bit skeptical on a personal level about this stuff, but I also empathize with both sides. I see why people are super excited about it. I'm also super excited about it. I'm kind of, um, I'm very neutral about this subject because like on the one hand, I feel like we, we need to take the brakes off and like we can't control the box. So we might as well unpack the box and deal with the cards we're dealt as best as we can rather than try and fight it. Like rather than struggle against the current list and try and row with it. Let's just try and sail with the current and see what we can do here because we're going to go through some crazy great filters that could potentially wipe out humanity or at the very least like cripple us. So if we are going to be going through these big gates, these big like filters that could potentially devastate us, why not just go full steam ahead and sail and surf along those, those rifts as best as we can. And, if we are going to survive as humanity and we are going to progress, then maybe this is the only way we can do that. I think this is like a Winston Churchill quote, but it's like, if you're going through hell, keep going. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like that. Like I, I, th I think if we quote him a lot, but one of the reasons why I like quoting him is because you're familiar with him and a lot of our listeners will be, whether or not you agree with him or disagree with him is, is irrelevant. Like there's a lot of things he says I disagree with and a lot of things he says I agree with. That's just how I, that's just how I am. I think everyone should be a little bit more like that where even if you don't necessarily like someone or you do like them, don't necessarily agree with everything they say or disagree with everything they say, you know, try and take each statement and each thing they're talking about um, as, as this individual thing and try not to like get too caught up in how you feel about people, whether or not you like them or dislike them. But as far as John Pearson is concerned, he did talk about, um, uh, I can't remember exactly the wording he used, but it was like he was something to the effect of um, you have you have to it, when you're dealing with like demons or what have you like it's into the dark the dark side of humanity like it, the best way to deal with that is to keep going face it and come back like girded from that to come back like strong and resilient from that and now you're able to tackle the world with this resilience because you face that darkness and you've come out the other side and the same way with like what you're saying about the Churchill quote of like, when you're in hell, keep pushing forward. Like what else are you going to do? Like just cry about the fact that you're in hell or like whine about it or like get, get too fearful. Like fear is a reaction. Courage is a choice. And I feel like we've got no choice, but to be scared, but we also have the choice to be courageous as well. Yeah. I, I, I like the Churchill quote because it's like, don't, it's so clear like don't stop what are you gonna do stop and smell the roses when you're in hell you just gotta gotta push through yeah. you know you gotta get out of there so you, you gotta keep going if you're going through hell keep going i love it are you familiar with uh the idea of anti-fragility you heard of this term before i have but let's talk talk about what that means anyway because what you were saying a moment ago i think uh is like an description of anti-fragility is like if you've got a box and you've got like a something glass inside the box you've got something inside the box and you shake it and it breaks the box you shake the box and the thing inside breaks then that's what we call fragile right mm. um but if you've got something inside the box and you shake it and it doesn't break then that's called uh 
resilient that's resilient yeah that's that's tough right so there's one more level and then there's anti-fragile yeah so the anti-fragility is you shake the box and the thing inside becomes stronger that's anti-fragile mm -hmm. and i think that's, I, that's that's what you try to be as a human being is to be anti-fragile that's what we that's the that's the the superman that's like the optimum because if you can do that holy shit are you strong like when someone accosts you in life or say like someone breaks into your house and steals your shit like you can be fragile and be devastated by this and take years to recover and it's like completely fucked your life up you can be resilient and be like oh well shit fucking happens and just deal with it and keep moving forward or you could be anti-fragile and be like hang on a minute now nah, i'm gonna grow from this i'm gonna become a smarter less naive more vigilant person that's not going to be like so easily deceived next time for this to happen again and i'm gonna let this experience shape me into being the version of myself that is not necessarily improved but just you know more more aware more more, more evolved in a micro sense yeah y your body as as a general rule is anti-fragile like your muscles right if you break down your muscles, mm -hmm. you put them through hell, then they become stronger. And mentally, you can become stronger if that's your if that's your goal, right? If if that's how you think about each situation, then you can become anti fragile, right? You think about not being damaged by things and just being hard and tough. That's not good enough. You need to be maybe broken down, but to grow big, better, stronger. Uh, more resilient in the future. Harder, better, faster, stronger. No, yeah. it's. Uh, I do think it's a good that concept. The, but do you not think that society kind of? I'm not so sure of the synonym I want to use, but for lack of a better one, like glorify victimhood in the sense of there's incentives to be um, fragile in society. That could be taking the form of like you know someone having a disability or disorder and they use that not only as a crutch but as like you know a, a means of identifying and interfacing with the world so if you're going on x or facebook or what have you and you're making a big deal about you know like having like i don't know bi bipolar or you're making that your whole identity or like hey everyone i'm autistic or hey everyone i'm, I'm this or hey everyone i'm that and having that kind of mindset of like putting defining yourself and putting yourself in this like fragile state already like i i feel like is a very slippery slope because if you keep going down that route of like have, looking through the the world through the lens of like poor me or having that kind of like victim mindset i feel like you'll never ever develop the kind of resilience or, or anti-fragility needed to actually deal with real world situations that are going to be coming your way in the future and might hit you harder than mike tyson punching you in the face ever could yeah no i agree i agree but um i, th I think that this is a this is like a communist ideology remnant. It's a remnant of of communist mentality, right? The victim, the victim victimizer mentality of everyone in the society is either taking advantage or um, being taken advantage of. Uh, everyone's a victim or a victimizer, and you, as a in a communist yeah. landscape, you have to be a victim because if you're not a victim then you're a victimizer and you deserve to be destroyed um by the society right you need to be destroyed and removed from uh the the wider society so every like this is this is what you would see in any society that gets subverted by communism is that everyone is clamoring to show what a victim they are um so that they they will not be destroyed so they'll that they'll be treated well by the society by by the uh by the government by the the wider society and it's it's just it's so pathetic it's so pathetic everyone walking around with this completely negative mentality and mindset it's not progressive yeah. for the society and you can see how backwards everything is in societies that are com that have gone through communism right they they've dropped back you know 50 100 years in terms of their progression before they could even make one step forward 
Yeah, I mean, I want to really like dig into some of the things you were talking about just a moment ago, especially about the people out there and like having this abuser slash abusee mindset. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a, a British synth pop band uh, duo called uh, Uriv Mix. Um, they had a song called Sweet Dreams. Most of you probably know the Marilyn Manson version, you know, Sweet Dreams are made of these, that one. But in, in those lyrics, it says like some people want to use you and some people want to be used by you some people want to abuse you and some people want to be abused by you and I, I really do feel like in society there's this like coin of narcissism where you're either this like more covert side where it's like you've got this more like victim mindset but deep down you're kind of feeding off this like negativity of like being abused and used you kind of almost like like that glorification of that and you you you, you embody that more because it gives you an excuse for not having to take responsibility in your life for certain things whereas there's also this other side of not the narcissism coin where they people that want to be abused abusive and sadistic so you've got this sort of like sadomasochistic dynamic going on where there's abusers and abusees out there creating these toxic relationships and environments where some of them are like you know getting off on abusing one another and the other people are actually kind of getting off on being abused even though it's causing them trauma and it's not healthy for them in a way it's like it's also validating for them because like it's it's attention it's it's the kind of connection that they've come used to either from their dysfunctional childhoods or what, what have you it's ironic that most of the people who claim to be abused or who claim to be a victim are the most abusive and the most victimizing people like they're they're so toxic you can see it online all right. the time there's just yeah. millions of different uh, examples of people who are yeah. you know really claiming this victimhood status and then turning around and doing horrible things to people who you know they they view as abusers even even if the abuse is so minuscule you know what i mean like it's it's such a minor abuse that maybe even isn't real abuse it's just like a perceived abuse you know what i mean like right exactly not intentional certainly not intentional just a perceived on the part of the abusee and now they're going to turn around and completely like blatantly abuse that person and feel justified about lens. doing it exactly yeah. And this is, these are the covert narcissists that I'm talking about. These are the most dangerous motherfuckers out there, by the way. They're very hard to spot with a much more traditional narcissist, very egotistical, very like, um, you know, what's the word for it? Uh, there's a good word for it. I can't remember off the top of my head. But like you know, they're, they're you know they're very egotistical and like all Boastful. about themselves. Both, yeah, they're, they're they're all about it. You know, they're all about that. But the covert narcs, they're actually they come across really charming and nice and sweet and like poor me kind of attitude. And you're kind of oh, this guy seems alright, seems pretty chill. But underneath that, underneath that exterior, they might even seem like goody two shoes. They might they might even go to the soup kitchens at a homeless shelter. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, hang on a minute, Sean. If they're going down to the homeless shelter and helping the poor, doesn't that make them good people? Ah, yes. If they're doing it for the purposes of lifting up the community and helping, sure. But these people aren't doing it for those reasons. They're doing it to create an image. To fo They're doing it with the short-term gain of fostering an image of being this nice person, as opposed to doing it for the legitimate reason of, say, just liking helping people, helping the local community or what have you. They're doing it specifically to create this image because they're not going to abuse people in the outer circles to the stranger on the street, to the guy at the soup kitchen, to the guy on the road. They're going to be nice as roses to that person. But when they get home to their wives and their kids and stuff, that's when the abuse, the cycle of abuse will actually be taking place behind closed doors and away from anyone else because that's how abuse is most deadly because from the outside looking in that person is not an abuser they're this guy that's super nice at work and he goes out and helps out at church and he seems like a really cool guy or really cool girl but underneath it behind closed doors there's a cycle of abuse taking place usually to the people closest to them i think the the covert narcissists aren't as covert as they they think that they are a lot of them are uh you know on twitter or whatever on X, yeah, um, and those are the low functioning ones. They think that they're the the narcissist. Like, think about it like this: is that the narcissist, the covert narcissist, thinks that everything is about them, right? That these <laughs> yeah. abuses are all about them, right? They're they're the victim in this whole situation, even though there's you know m 
people who are way more victimized than they are. There's things that are going on in the world that are way worse than what's happening to them. They, they, the world revolves around them. They are the, mm -hmm. the victim in the story. And so thus they are uh, justified in whatever response that they do, right? No matter what right. they decide um, to do, they are justified in that. And it's like, uh, th that's the biggest narcissistic viewpoint of all, right? Thinking that they are completely justified in, in yeah, abusing other very, people. They have very warped sense of reality and the mental gymnastics they're able to do inside their own heads and lie, lie to themselves. They're, they're such good deceivers that they, they're very good at tricking themselves. So as far as they're concerned, they actually are these nice people that really do have your best interests at heart. And if you could just dress a little bit less slutty, you'd be such a better girlfriend. And they kind of got this mentality of like, yeah, I'm not actually controlling you. I'm just like helping you be a better person. They'll look at it through whatever lens they need to, to justify their behavior, either that's like through the lens of you've done something nasty to them so it's okay for them to do nasty to you or it, they'll justify their controlling behavior through like um you know justify in terms of like doing something altruistic or for you know with good intentions as far as they're concerned despite actually doing something abusive all right let's uh change gears here i'm gonna use the washroom we'll be right back okay sounds good okay we're back how are you doing, Shun? Doing pretty great. Feeling pretty refreshed. Got another coffee here. I've got some nice barista oat milk. And, uh, you know, I make sure when I boil the kettle, not that you give a shit, um, you know, I let the water settle a little bit so that I don't scorch the coffee. Because when you, like, you know, pour in the hot water, if it's too boiling, then they'll actually, like, burn the coffee and like, kind of give it a bit of a bitter taste. So I was very strategic in making myself a nice beverage of coffee. I don't usually drink coffee only whenever I'm casting doing a podcast or something very specific mm. i hate to be a bummer but you probably shouldn't drink oat milk i mean I think, I think i've heard you talk about this before yeah maybe there's something maybe you're right i don't know there's very little actual oats and there's no milk in oats really i thought they kind of like got the oats and like wrung them together and lots of milk squirted out i'm joking <laughs> <laughs> yeah, reminds like, me of that like it's like almond do you milk. ever see yeah, this is like YouTube channel, I think, called like the Carbonara Effect or something, and he does like kind of like a magic show, but he does it under the guise of like you know being like a shop owner or something. And like one of the things he does is like get literal almonds and squeezes them, and milk shoots out. And these people <laughs> actually believe this milk inside the almonds. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. Yeah, I think there's like um a handful of almonds, and then every almond milk container like a liter of almond milk there's like a you know small handful of almonds that um they're, they're, just they're almond really, flavored yeah, milk <laughs> what's just, in the milk then how are they making this shit huh some industrial ingredients just uh, oh yeah like, this is getting rid of some waste products so like yeah. we'll just give this guy something to flavor their tea with yeah exactly <laughs> it's not good it's mostly ash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's mostly like some some sort of weird filler chemical that they don't really know exactly what it's doing to your body. It's been passed. Not to investigate off, this. You yeah. got me curious now. Some oat milk conspiracy theory to look into. Yeah, you should look it up. A lot of these. You look into it. A lot of these like replacement um things foods are horrible just horrible for your body like uh the fucking beyond meat burger or something like that mm. uh, it's mostly like i think it's like a huge percentage of it is vegetable oil and vegetable oil is terrible it's terrible for your body it's it's just horrendously so what do you think about almond milk then how are you how are you on almond milk there's no milk in almonds, man. It's mostly... Yeah, but like... what about the, the health benefits of, say, almond versus oat, oat milk? Would you say that almond is also a problem, or, like, maybe almond's a better alternative? No, they're both they're both the same. They're the same sort of thing. The amount of almonds in there is minuscule. The amount of oats inside oat milk is minuscule. It's mostly these filler products that they're using, these, like, industrial ingredients that they're using is mostly what you're drinking. You're only drinking a tiny bit of almond or a tiny bit of oat. 
And, now, uh, yeah. someone someone might argue with you, not that I, I, I am, but someone else might be like, well, hang on a minute, saying like hot dogs are kind of garbage meat, but mechanically recovered meat, but I like the taste of hot dogs. So why do I, why do I care if it's got some weird, weird produce and it was made in a weird way? If it tastes good. Just imagine if a hot dog was like 90% some like filler ingredient and 10% meat. That's what you're. That's what you're drinking when you drink oatmeal. Isn't that basically <laughs> hot dogs are for the cheap no, ones? Hot, hot, hot dogs are <laughs> good like hot dogs are pretty ground good. up, ground up. Uh, you know, cartilage and stuff like that. Still, it's the still meat. Recovered meat. It's yeah. still, it's still. Um, wow. It's it's still animal product, right? Like it's. it's yeah, there's it's, something in there. That's animal. Yeah. Whether it's, or not, it's good. Right, <laughs> up for debate. But the good, hot, good, good hot dogs though are pretty well produced in terms of like it is quite a lot of meat and just good, good amount of like animal fat and what have you. And like, there's not a lot of additive to it. Right. But usually the hot dogs are pretty cheaply made and are that like re mechanically recovered meat kind of gut type shit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I don't think that hot dogs are good for you either. I'm just, I'm just saying that almond milk is worse because it's not even almonds. It's like ten percent almond or five percent almond, okay. so yeah, it, it's it's not a good alternative. A lot of these alternatives are terrible. Like the Beyond Meat, like I said, mostly vegetable oil, and vegetable yeah, I oil agree with goes that. through an incredible industrial process. Um, that's like, I mean, a lot of these people who would push you to eat Beyond Meat burgers would say that processed foods are bad for you, right? They would say, like, right. oh, these processed foods, you shouldn't be eating all that. Just stick to these other foods, you know? But then they push Beyond Meat Burger. It's like, dude, <laughs> this this shit is the most processed stuff imaginable. It's beyond processed. It's it's an industrial product completely. So Yeah, I mean, I'm going to look more into it, to be honest with you. I'm curious now about... If I should stop drinking oat milk or not, Saiyan's opened my eyes. He can mm -hmm. show me the door, but I have to walk through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's how it is. I, I send a lot of information to friends and stuff about different um, foods, health stuff. Most of it I appreciate the tip. <laughs> Most of I appreciate it the ignored. tip. I'll look into it, man. No, for real, I'll look into it. You know? Yeah, it's all good. Um, I'm open-minded. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Shun. Very glad. I, I, don't, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be so open minded that my brain falls out like some people, but at the same time, I, I do want to really like keep my lens as broad of scope as possible. Hopefully, get that high resolution pictures. You know what I'm saying? Where did this open minded uh, mentality, this open minded demeanor, come from? From from your <laughs> from your family, from your from your childhood? Um, I don't know actually. I, now that you ask, I can't I can't think of like the thing that was the catalyst that you know initiated this, so to speak. But I, my dad was my dad my dad like uh he kind of got me thinking a lot as a kid. Like it wasn't so much that he made me open minded, but he did challenge me a lot. Like he wasn't the kind of dad that you know would just let you say some shit. He, if you said something dumb, he would explain to you like why it was dumb, not necessarily in an abusive way or anything, but like, you know, he, he, he talked to me like an adult, even though I wasn't an adult. So even when I was like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, or however old I was, he'd be like, oh, oh yeah, is, is that really what you think? Yeah. Well, what about this? Uh, he'd like, you know, challenge my suppositions or whatever. I kind of bullshit. I parroted out because I'm just a dumb kid at this point. And he would challenge me on that and force me to think about it or force me to think about something I'm I'm talking about. So not necessarily my own but my own views or beliefs, but if I if I say paraphrase something someone else is saying, he's gonna challenge it because he wants me to think deeper about it. He doesn't want me to actually just like think think like what someone else thinks. He wants me to actually go into that and like and he'd he had a very scientific um, orientated mind of being skeptical about everything. And like he had a very scientific process of like trying to disprove things before being content with that information, if that makes sense. That's cool. I mean, talking to your kids like they're at like a adult, I, I think that's a, a huge benefit to a child as you're coming up, learning how to challenge your beliefs and really think things through rather than just parroting out ideas. Yeah. If, I feel like that is a trend that I see 
with a lot of people I, that I, I like who are smart is that their uh, families didn't like go easy on them and, and treat them like a mm. child. Like they were treated like an adult. They were challenged right. and, and pushed um, in their younger years and they became like more de better developed. I think yeah. like, it's something I, I consider if I was a, if I was a parent, like really talking to my oh, yeah. kids like an adult. I can empathize because there were points in my life where times that he did do that, it made me have a more reaction of fragility where it like in the, in the moment made me feel like, Oh fuck, I'm just a dumbass or something. It did kind of have that effect on me at times, but over the, like the grand scheme of things over the course of years, it did make me more anti-fragile. Initially it made me fragile in some instances, but then it also made me very resilient in others. And then eventually it developed um, anti-fragility where it was like, not only is this challenging me, but it's forcing me to grow and be more introspective and more like um, open-minded and considerate of like other viewpoints and other possibilities rather than being so easily like led by others. It's good to get challenged a little bit when you're younger. Like uh, I really value um, my cousin when I was young. He like, he uh, tormented me a little bit in terms of just like, uh, just teasing, you know, very light mm. teasing, but, he was very funny and uh, it helped me to just kind of laugh at myself. And when other people would tease me, it made it less potent, you know, because they were not nearly as funny or as like cutting as my cousin. So, you know, they're, they're <laughs> dumb little like high school jokes would be like, oh, really? That's the best you could think of? What Come on. the ducks back to you now? <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. That's kind of what banter is though, right? It's like that, that mental hardening. It's not meant to, to draw it, to bring you down. It's meant to to either develop resilience or develop this anti-fragility where it's like, yeah, and what may have heard worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's the intention anyway, for sure. But uh, I feel like it worked worked well for me. And, um, mm. yeah, I never, I, you know, I would get uh, frustrated with people at, in high school and stuff, but I never, um, I never felt like they were that intelligent, like, wow, this person's definitely better than me. You know what I mean? Like, I always felt like they were just a dumbass <laughs> being mean. Well, usually people, if they're doing it from a place of trying to actually bring you down and be a dickhead about it, they're usually not that funny. If the funniest people are usually the ones that aren't actually trying to bring you down, they're mm -hmm. just trying to be funny. They're yeah. just doing it for the sake of comedy. So everything they do is like a comedic opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's sure. why they come across as more funny because they're not actually trying to just be dickheads. They're trying to just like seize any moment for a comedic opportunity. Exactly. And they're only mean if you th if you think that they're mean, right? If they're being mean, it's it's um mm -hmm. if you can just laugh along with it, then it's it's not actually real well, meanness. You can also right? take you can take their power away. Say it well, even if it was someone being mean to you, actually being mean to you, you mm -hmm. take their power away by laughing along with it and also doubling down on their own deprecation. So if it, if they're like saying like, oh yeah, by the way, saying you know you, you're a real sausage monkey sometimes, you're like yeah, yeah I'm a real sausage monkey. Yeah, yeah. If you double down on the joke as well, like you're taking a lot of sting out of it, and it's mm -hmm. like then what do they have over you? It's kind of like the Eminem thing of like saying everything he can say about you as well. So it's like, now what, where, where are you going to go with this? Like, yeah, I am that. And what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a good message to, to any young person coming up right now. If they're uh, struggling with some sort of um, bullying or that type of thing, it's uh it's good to just like break down what they're actually saying and just go like, mm -hmm. you know, find a way to make it funny, make it funnier. Um, and if you can't do said. that, yeah. if you can't do that, if you don't feel like you have like either the charisma or like the mental freedom to like in the moment, think of like something witty to say, just have a few stock lines prepared just to get you going just so you have the resilience so like so when they say something to you you're like yeah yeah well if you're my comeback you have to scrape it off your mum's teeth mate or if like you know like they say some some bullshit to you, and you're like yeah well your 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 teeth are so far apart it looks like your tongue's in prison you know what i mean like you just have a few stock lines prepared to like just like you know roll with the punches and like give something back even if it's not like properly tailor made to them and in, in the moment mm. great advice from shin for those young youngsters out there
<laughs> in the social landscape of the 20, 21st century. 2024, I can't imagine being in high school right now. Can you imagine 2024 being in high school? What a, what a mind. I honestly think it'd be easier for me right now. I mean, I mean, I, I can't really speak from experience. I went to some... I grew up in some rougher areas. Like at the time, the area that I grew up in was like rated like the third most like chaviest slash like antisocial area in the UK. It's much nicer now, but back then when I was growing up, yeah, it was not so good. Chav, that's a good uh, British term. <laughs> I call the females chavettes. Mm. That's um. <clears throat> That's that's something I kind of think about sometimes. Like, what if I personally had grown up in a different society? Like, how different would I be? Like, what if I had grown up in Japanese society and gone to Japanese high school? You know, what what kind Might of personality would I? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe I would be more like um, easy to control. You know, more uh yeah open maybe. to to society's control you know maybe i'd be less uh, rebellious maybe i'd be more right. willing to just like take on a job and and work at a company you know my whole life like a lot of people do here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. oh by the way i should probably do a little disclaimer um, anyone who's listening that hasn't heard the expression chav before um Oxford Dictionary kind of defines it as someone that's like coarse uh, and rude or like um, have have the implication of being of low social status. Maybe that will help clear up what we're talking about. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've watched a, a whole YouTube video about it. It was pretty fun, fun to watch. Uh, there's like <laughs> some people who really go into depth of what a chav actually is and how the term developed, the, the right. sort of like the style and like, the you know the tracksuit and the um, well, they had, Burber yeah they Burberry. adopted Burberry Burberry exactly yeah. yeah they adopted the Burberry um fashion label basically mm -hmm. the Burberry cap the um, most by most iconically the sort of like baseball cap with the kind of like tartan tan design of the Burberry and like kind of that was the that was the look for the chav and how you would easily distinguish them at a distance you know they were they made themselves known in the wild so funny subculture but um yeah i know what you're talking about kind of a chavy neighborhood where you grew up then did you go to an all boys school school or no no i didn't go to an all boys school but i did bounce around a lot um my mum and dad went through a very early divorce because my sister was in hospital with leukemia and like the relationship kind of broke down after that so i was kind of ping-ponging between my mum and my dad and uh, i went to like say four different junior schools for example um i was a bit of a a, a a naughty boy as well because of like some shit going on in my life i was also very anti-authority which was kind of strange because i did I did really well in Marine Cadets at a very young age. I was one of the youngest there. I think I was like 11 turning 12 when I first joined. And uh, that taught me a lot about discipline. And I actually was very well behaved in the Royal Marine Cadets. And I actually did like some of the authority there. I just didn't see a more legitimate authority outside of that military organization, if that makes sense. So when I was in school listening to a teacher, it was more of an individual basis. Like some teachers loved me because I got on well with them and I respected them. And other teachers hated me because I didn't respect them. I didn't respect their authority the way that they were trying to leverage their authority over me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. It's interesting. So and a lot of, yeah. Go go on. I was going to say a lot of teachers like had this kind of like l very lazy approach to teaching where it's like, if there's disruption in the class, they just, they just want to deal with it. So a lot of the times I would have gotten sent out of the class for something I actually didn't do. It's just that I would usually be known for doing things. So when something went wrong, if there was no evidence, it'd be like, Oh, Jay, leave the room. You're the one that's probably responsible. So you're the one that's going to go out. And like, I, I'm the kind of guy where if I was responsible, I'll happily stand up and leave and not cause a fuss. But there was so many times where I got told to leave the room when I literally had nothing to do with it. Mm. And I would, I would protest to the point where I would not leave the room and they'd have to move the entire class instead of me. Mm. So Marine cadets, I've never heard of that before. That's, that's where you learn some discipline. Royal Marine cadets, Royal is, Navy. Yeah. Is that like, 
is that like boy scouts or what it kind of uh, oh, no that? it's not like boy scouts um uh, when you first join it's mostly like physical training and parade so you're like literally just learning how to march so like you learn how to stand in formation and you, you very quickly need discipline because you're standing there and your whole body is itching to move i mean literally itching to move where you have to put your hand up and be like permission to itch sir because your leg is on fire because you've been standing still for an hour straight because they're just making you stand at attention for ages to make sure you just fucking get it and then like you're you're marching in coordination with the others they're going left 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 right left one top three four so you learn how to march and they, they teach you all like how to wheel left and wheel right properly they teach you all that like parade ground stuff to kind of drill in that discipline issue and then eventually the fun stuff is happening where like you you like end up going off to camp and you're stat you're like they, they they drive you into like a fort in the middle of nowhere where it's like I'm not, I'm not, it's probably on a map but it's 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 in the middle of nowhere there's nothing nearby like the nearest village is like an hour's drive away at least and like they've got an armory there with loads of guns in it and they end up like letting you shoot and doing like paintball competitions where you're like you're fighting against someone else and you know and, and like um blank round exercises where it's like a nighttime assault where you've got like actual uh basically you've got live guns but instead of like live ammunition you've got blank rounds and like flashbangs to simulate grenades and stuff hmm. so we did like that kind of stuff as well which is fucking crazy awesome for a kid like i was like I think 12 and a half, 13, like getting to shoot real guns and like simulate nighttime raids and stuff with like flashbangs going off and like gunfire going off. It was fucking awesome. It's like pre-military almost. Like you're just getting ready for yeah. your job in the military. That's kind of crazy. So you, you did all that. You had a lot of fun, but you didn't ever think about joining the military? I, I was actually. In fact, during the <laughs> during the the pandemic, I was in the process of becoming a warfare specialist for the Royal Navy as a submariner, and I actually passed all my exams. But because of COVID hitting the when it did, disrupted everything, um, pushed back my deadlines enough that I just barely went over the age threshold for that role. Like I was already like on the end of that spectrum of like this is the year I have to sign up. Mm. And because of COVID, it got pushed back and I wasn't able to sign up as a warfare specialist anymore. Really? So were you in the military before that or did you just sign no. up as a warfare specialist? No. I just I did yeah. And I went through the examination process and passed all the exams pretty well and shit. And I was even the only guy in the exams that knew the difference between a ship and a boat, which I thought was hilarious for like a Royal Navy entrance exam. Hmm. That is a bit silly, but um yeah. that's that's too bad. You you were really gunning for that. What what was your like dream role for that? What, what was it? What was it going to be your job if you well? If you did that? So if I was a warfare specialist, there'd be a few roles. I'd be the guy that manned the general purpose machine gun on top of the submarine when we're in port and stuff. Like say we're in port and like there's potential hostiles or like I've got to like just make sure everything's safe. I'd be the guy on top of the submarine with the machine gun. That's so one thing. So you'd be in. The, That's one thing. So you'd be in the submarine. Yes. With the submarine. And, uh, Yes, and the the other role I'd be having is basically um, analyzing like the acoustic sonar of the vessel. So, say it's such a powerful vessel, the astute class submarine, the hunter killer submarine that the British have. Like, even just while docked in Portsmouth Port, they can like passively um, hear the sound of a ship leaving New York Harbor. Like from that far away, without the use of any boys to like ping off sonars and stuff, nothing. Just just pure acoustic attenuation of just listening. And right. they can and I'm I'm basically looking at sound profiles of ships and being like, oh, I know that ship has a weird propeller and it makes this kind of weird this weird like sound profile. So I could identify the ships based on their like unique characteristics and stuff like that. You know what I mean? I see. I see. So and you working yeah. in a submarine that's pretty scary are you not claustrophobic at all i mean i spend a lot of my life in claustrophobic environments uh, i'm a tall guy but nowadays it's not as big a deal to be over six foot and working on a sub they're a little bit bigger now and um i mean i still wouldn't be it wouldn't, it wouldn't be optimal still but yeah that would that'd be crazy fun for me i'd be going to places where then literally not even on a world map. I'd be like docking at places which aren't even on the world map and like no one else even knows this place exists. Like mm. I'd be doing some really fun stuff in that role. Right. But you'd be uh at at um or you'd be in the submarine like multiple months at a time, right? 
Yeah, so the longest deployment that they will disclose is three months. That's the longest time a submarine is usually deployed for, but it's not. It's probably a lot longer sometimes if they're doing something a little bit like off the record, so to speak. But yeah, the usual patrols are somewhere between two and three months you'd be out and you'd you'd either you'd either be on a Vanguard class submarine, which is basically like just doing like nuclear patrols where like you're on standby in case there's like a nuclear threat from Russia, you're the nuclear deterrent. So like say if the Britain gets nuked, you can still launch your nukes from the ocean kind of thing. Right. Um but there's also the other role, which I would be, which is the the hunter killer submarine, the astute class submarine, which is not carrying nuclear weaponry. It's like you know anti submarine kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'd, instead, I'd be like tracking, I'd be like trailing behind a Russian submarine for months, and they wouldn't even know I was there, kind of thing. Mm. Right, just just tracking them and picking up their movements, mm -hmm. figuring out what they're up to. Yeah. That kind of thing. Hmm. Well, that's like a totally different world. Did you hear about the submarine that um went down and you know went deeper than any other submarine and then got crushed? Was it like a Are you talking the, the submersible vehicle thing or Yeah, yeah, the submersible vehicle. Yeah, one. yeah. That yeah, I heard like, about that. I saw the the um uh, what's it? The CGI rendition of she what was... happened. It was like within a What did they show? Second. Well, then yes, like... I was about to say. I was about to say how realistic was it? Because if it was realistic, it would be so quick you wouldn't even be able to tell it was happening. It would be faster yeah. than a split second. I mean, one minute the ship is okay, the boat is okay, rather, and the next minute it's like, and you're gone. It'd be that quick. You just you wouldn't even be able. To, your body would not even be able to physically register how fast it. It's literally faster than your human reaction speed. Your yeah. human react your average reaction speed is between 150 and 250 milliseconds. It's faster than that. Yeah, they were saying something like the. Uh, the pain, like for your brain to even register pain, takes like 180 milliseconds or something. Yeah, it's too and, slow. And the the ship collapsing was like 20 milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's faster than a tenth of a second. It's yeah. it's it's a a twentieth. Sorry, it's uh, I don't know how to, to phrase it, but yeah, it's like point two. 0.02 or something. It's right. between like point two and point. It's crazy fast. You can't even register it. No. So yeah, it just basically got shredded. So no pain, no uh, you know, no agony and death, but just uh, like just a whooshing sound. Maybe you might have registered mm -hmm. something. And Do you know they build submarines dead. in sections? Like they 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 build them like say I can't remember how long, but like say like ten meter sections all like welded together. Really? Hmm. Yeah, know. and what's even more crazier <laughs> is that the alloys that they use to weld those pieces together are actually quite special because it, it, it the submarine is actually the strongest at those welds mm. the, the the metallurgy that's the, the I can't remember, that's the correct way of saying that that word metallurgy um metallurgy yeah. yeah but the, what the alloys that they're using are like so advanced and creative that it's actually strongest at those points of, which you wouldn't think mm -hmm. it, for a submarine at least yeah that's that's pretty cool um i bet there's the I think that's one thing, actually, we've talked so much about AI and um, Neuralink and stuff like the software side of things, mm. the the technolo of, of technology. I think that one area that hasn't really advanced much and, and is due for like a revolution is like the materials side of things, you know, the the metals that we're, we've been using for so long, you know, carbon fiber is like a big thing that's come around. Um there's been like Kevlar and stuff like that, but I, I think that we're mm -hmm. due, we're due for like a big breakthrough in um that side of things in the the materials science side of things. Yeah, that would be. I imagine soldiers of Neuralink. Soldiers with Neuralink, yeah, maybe. Imagine soldiers being able to interface with drone swarms with Neuralink. Yeah. Like you got a drone operator on the ground who's like tele telekinetically interfacing with drone swarms. Right, yeah, I, I imagine that would be pretty impressive. Uh, that would add a lot to the the their fighting strength. Um, did you hear Elon Musk talking about um, like what war is gonna look like in the future? He was discussing like um the the sort of battlefield uh idea, like what what's what uh, what is a battlefield actually gonna look like in if we had Nothing like a like major he's world probably war? Gonna... I mean, nothing like he's probably going to describe, but tell me what he said. He said that basically 
uh, tanks are just like rolling death traps. They don't have any uh, no. defense against drones, right? Only against conventional weaponry and not against this future shit, yeah. That planes are not even going to be able to get off the ground because there's way too much anti air missiles and they're too, you know, uh, they're, they're too good at shooting things down. So there, there won't even be air superiority. It'll be there'll be no plans. Depends at how all. depends how sophisticated the electric electronic warfare is on those the aircraft. Like if it's like really sophisticated, maybe they could like fuck with the targeting capabilities of the missiles enough that they would be able to remain in the air for an extended time. But it's unlikely depending on how sophisticated the anti air missile system is. Yeah, I don't know, but they're they're say, he was saying that it would be just blank sky, and then um, it would. So basically, you know, uh, that there would be a massive defender's advantage with landmines and drones and machine guns, and everybody would basically mm -hmm. be on foot. It'd be pure infantry with long range artillery. Nah, it wouldn't be like, pure infantry. I think it, it, the infantry would just be fodder. There'd be pers there'd be personnel on the ground still, but it would be way more minimalistic, I imagine. There'd be way more heavy reliance on drones and what have you. Yeah, autonomous things. Drone, autonomous drones and shit. drones, infantry and long range artillery. It's basically yeah. World War I, I think, One with drones. I think he's right about <laughs> that. I just think there'll be way less what he said, but way less infantry involved and way more cyber warfare and electronic warfare. Mm. Maybe my opinion. Well, the infantry is the only thing that can move, right? I mean, there's, if there's no tanks, then it has to be in infantry. And all I mean, the yeah, but all the countries in the world have a abundance of infantry. <laughs> They've got a lot of people. So well, then it's gonna look like something in like the Terminator film where it's like these guys with like laser rifles just getting blasted by like machines. Yeah, but uh, all those big those big like clunky machines from Terminator that are you know flying in the air and walking on the ground, those things are gonna just get blasted by anti air missiles, you know. But they well, they won't be little big. They won't be giant machines that are like encumbers them. They'll be these little tiny drones that mm. just sneak up on you and drop a, a little bomb package on top of your squad and just like annihilate you remotely. Mm. Yeah. So it'll be drones, infantry, and long range artillery. It sounds like a I mean, goddamn I, nightmare. It, whoever's got the most sophisticated drone swarms will probably end up winning tactically because if your drones are sophisticated enough to take out their drones then you have their superiority and then you just dominate the ground infantry you know what it reminds me of, of is like when there things were happening in world war ii when the when the the battles were occurring in the ocean where you've got these uh super high-tech battle cruisers that are um floating around that have been like the dominant force in the ocean for you know, hundreds of years battleships right? as well battleships. not just battle cruisers yeah, yeah. and yeah. the the uh yeah, aircraft the aircraft just absolutely dominate them so aircraft carriers become like the thing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it, and you know these massive expensive ar uh, naval armies or naval um ships are just completely useless i think that's what's kind of happening on the ground now with well, drones the, the and battleships are and too tanks. large and too slow turning to actually like avoid being dove bomb or like torpedo bombed mm -hmm. by the aircraft carriers whereas like the smaller destroyer types are much more maneuverable able to dodge that kind of stuff while also still providing support to the aircraft carriers mm -hmm. but basically during the during world war ii those those ships, the big ships, just got completely destroyed, and they spent yeah. you know, huge quantities of money to try and keep those things running, and they're basically well, they, useless. They, they tried to like turn them into hedgehogs in terms of like just strapping as much anti-aircraft guns to them as possible, so mm -hmm. they could like shoot down the torpedo bombers as they were coming in load to drop the torpedoes and what have you. But the reality is, is like. Even if you gun down those pilots, the chances are they're still going to deliver their payload, and you can't afford to keep just losing battleships to to, to a few planes like that. Mm -hmm. So the same thing's going to happen on the ground as tanks just getting bombed by drones that cost almost nothing, and the drones yeah, cost you'll have a fifth pennies. A five thousand dollar drone, five thousand dollar drone max. That's like assuming like full military tech 
crazy shit on it like you know what i mean mm -hmm. probably even cheaper able to take out a tank that's like worth millions you know what i mean mm -hmm. like a 10 million dollar tank just boom easy yeah and that's that's what you just that's the war of attrition you want to shoot down a helicopter that costs 10 million dollars with a missile that costs 500k yeah yeah that's um it's gonna be weird man if that ever comes to pass i hope it doesn't i hope that things get contained over there um in the ukraine and in that area but now france is talking about going to war too like france is talking about sending troops into ukraine mm -hmm. oh it's so weird it really makes me who knows weird. maybe uh ukraine is just a, a test bed for this new style of warfare and it's kind of weird how we have this like high quality footage of the war as well like we're, we're seeing war like never before in terms of like the access the level of access to the footage if you know what i mean like, mm -hmm. we, we saw a, a bit of that with afghanistan but a lot of it was fairly low quality footage and like mm -hmm. infrared cameras and shit and what have you whereas now we're getting this like higher resolution gritty shit and it's either gonna like desensitize people to this shit or maybe hopefully wake up people to the realities of war but i also feel like there's a lot of virtue signaling going on and like people not realizing that this has always been what's going on it's just now you're seeing it mm, yeah uh, well i'm glad that you're not uh submarine commander or whatever submarine uh <laughs> <laughs> sonar reader that uh yeah knock those exams out of the park as well i think mm. i would have had a good time but maybe it wasn't my calling. Maybe the universe had different intentions for me. Maybe, maybe. Would be would be strange if there was a war, and you ended up being called up. <laughs> you gotta go. I might be one of the only ones left alive. If like the country gets taken out, the submariners would be probably the only ones left. Right. That and they can like operate for months with their supplies. Like they they got they can yeah they didn't have to surface for a long time. Mm hmm. Man, that would be such a trip. They won't actually tell you. They won't actually tell you how long they can stay operational for without surfacing this like classified information. But it's a long fucking time, guys. Right. A lot of those are powered they also by have... nuclear reactors too, so they're not. They they all do. They all do. The only ones that aren't are like the older Cold War era submarines, which mm. still rely on diesel engines as well. But even those like are using the diesel engines more as a backup these days. Um, but yeah, every single one of these submarines these days, the modern ones, especially the astute class, has like a third of the submarine dedicated to like the nuclear reactor, which is like off limits to most personnel. And what goes on back there is like highly classified. Like you can get pretty much all the details on the astute class submarine outside of the nuclear zone, so to speak, but inside there is like highly classified. Right. One thing really cool about the submarines is like there's this like ceramic tile outer layer where it's like these. Yeah, ceramic tiles on the outside of the um, submarine to kind of like dampen um, sonar pings and what have you to try and remain as like stealthy as possible. Like the amount of like ingenuity that goes into making this shit is crazy. And then after they make it, there's an officer that goes around the submarine and like says everything that's wrong with it. Mm. Like they're so analytical about it, anal about it. Like every little tiny detail like he'll go over and nitpick everything about the submarine he's not happy about kind of like the guy that comes in to inspect and leaves like 50 different pieces of tape pointing out the the, the, the defects or whatever right like he's doing that for the entire submarine like it's mm -hmm. crazy the level of detail that goes into the shit right well glad that we have uh people like that defending defending uh countries like uh, good countries like uh britain and <laughs> countries like japan i'm sure that there's a high level of detail in all of their uh planning here as well i don't yeah. think i don't think that uh there's like a full fleet of subs or anything like that for japan but they're like ramping up really hard here right now well they're probably being encouraged to because um what um, what nato want to do is put like a strangle on that strait in the the china sea to kind of like lock out China from any access to Taiwan and these other key locations for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan declared that um, any attack on Taiwan is attack on their like direct sovereignty. You know, like their their ability to to defend well, themselves. Trying, NATO, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, NATO's trying to draw a strong red line to prevent uh, China crossing it. So yeah. they're, they're playing hardball with China to be like, don't tempt us. So hopefully that's their goal is like basically to like try and deter China for long enough that they can get more control over the situation. But they don't have total control over the situation. Like they're like 10, 20 years out from being able to even like totally deny China from operating and doing that. Well... So China might buy its buy this time for like five, ten years, and then they can move. Who knows? Well, they need to deal with their internal problems first. China is a bag of just a mess, honestly. Just a communist country with um, so many different problems when it comes to leadership, and their military has been purged so many times. Like they've just gotten rid of the top top leadership so many times over and over again well i think that's an issue of the imperial system in the sense of their leader um is probably having an issue of like being able to trust his high leadership so i imagine there's gonna be a very strong turnover rate and not many people in that guy's room is going to be telling them what they actually think so there's going to be a bit of an issue of communication at the highest level in the chinese authority absolutely yeah, they're not like um, preparing particularly well for war either. Like, I think it's sixty percent of their training as a mil member of the military in China is ideological training. Mm. So they're they're like re rehearsing songs and like you know learning about communism and uh, socialism with. Chinese characteristics, Xi Jinping thought, that type of stuff. So right. a huge proportion of all military training is actually about uh, loyalty, right? Which yeah, is yeah. just kind of crazy to think about. Whereas, like, you know, how much time is spent with that type of thing in the American army? Like, maybe 0%, you know? Maybe, maybe 2%, maybe 1%. I don't know how much it is, but they're they're not like spending a lot of time like looking over the constitution and stuff and like <laughs> that's that's on your own time you know what i mean when you're here and fighting for the military like you're you're here getting ready to fight that's it that's what we're right. there for yeah I, I, I don't i don't know what americans are told when they sign up for the military i know that the royal marines are told something actually quite indoctrinating and religious they actually are basically told like hang on a minute guys you're, you're essentially warriors of god and you're going to be killing in the name of at the time the queen and the in the name of god essentially you're like they'll have that kind of propaganda whereas like you're warriors of god and that's what they're going to tell the, the new recruits that are coming in hmm. it's interesting is that what they told you in the cadet school as well <laughs> no but i have seen um footage from um royal marine commandos the young kids like 18 i mean like going into it and what the kind of things they're told in boot camp and blah 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 blah. Mm. But i think we got much of that i don't think we got much of that in cadets we got a little bit of that but not not that extreme like that's like a i think when push comes to shove and it's like actually time to be a royal marine that's when they tell you that shit powerful message for a young person Anyone who's looking to fight and die, if you're fighting and dying for God. Well, a, Ro a Royal Marine's ethos is first as a humanitarian first and a warrior second. So a lot of the things they're doing is actually humanitarian aid, like, you know, bringing food to people that are in a really fucking bad situation and doing it with a fucking shitty grin on their face. That's the whole point. Like, you're not only, you're not only like doing this crazy hard stuff, but you're doing it with a smile on your face to uplift the people around you, not only your own soldiers, but the people you're helping. Mm. It's a nice ethos. It's one, thing they're look it's one thing they're looking for in training. They're looking for people that are like going through that hard, crazy bullshit, but with a, with a smile on their face. That's, that's what they're going to be looking for. Mm. Interesting. It's kind of like that anti-fragility thing we were talking about. Like if you're like, if you're like Sisyphus, but you start to enjoy the process and can smile while pushing that boulder up the mountain, like you're born and bred to be a Royal Marine. State of mind. Mm. 
do you want to go do you want to circle back around to what we were talking about earlier and like um about ourselves and do a little bit more background digging sure so i'm a bit more i'm a bit curious about you as well like i mean I, I know you a little bit but even though we cast together and we chill together and we talk together for as long as we have i, I mean I, I i still could could never know you i don't think about actually diving into you more what do you want to know shun <laughs> well first i want to ask like what turned you on to starcraft initially like how old were you why did you get so interested in it what about that first of all I want to tackle this subject with you well i started out with um age of empires 2 and a friend of mine at elementary school he uh, introduced me to starcraft and he burned a, a copy for me like I got mm -hmm. a burned copy of Age of Empires and I just I just liked it. I just uh enjoyed the space opera, you know, the the idea of it, the the campaign, the story, everything just kind of resonated with me, so I liked it a lot. I liked the the campaign or the the editor was amazing uh, for the time, right? The the amount of uh yeah. use map settings uh games that you could get into on Battle.net it was uh <laughs> oh, yeah. mind boggling. So I had a lot of fun with that and I played a huge amount of StarCraft growing up. Um yeah, me just too. just in terms of just like use map settings, just fun games. I'm messing around, you know, playing team uh, how games. Long, how long was it until you actually started playing like as they used to call it low money maps, like you know, the actual like one v one melee version of the game? I didn't really play much as a kid and then when I when StarCraft 2 came out I started playing a bunch of StarCraft 2. Um I played until Wings uh, of Liberty was over. I played like a little bit of Hots out of the Swarm. What did you then, play race wise? Um I played Zerg. Okay. And um I had uh I had some fun with that. I had some success like I got to masters and stuff, but um yes. It was uh, not what I, I didn't really enjoy it that much because of the con constant changing landscape. Like I was just always trying to catch up with what was changing in the meta because of the changes that were happening in the, yeah. you know, in the constant balancing of the game. The, the aggressive so, balance updates. Yeah. So I just, I got kind of tired of it and, um, you know, moved on to other things, but. I always watched StarCraft throughout all of that time. I always watched the pros players. Mm. And when I was very young, I uh, had like an iPod touch um, that I got GOM TV. They're like uh, their <laughs> old uh, app on there. And I would watch that nice. at night, try to catch like the live, the live feeds. I would watch like the first hour or whatever and go to sleep because <laughs> I couldn't stay up any later. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I, I I was always watching, and then when Remastered was announced, uh, I started playing a little bit of 1v1 and just messing around, and when Remastered came out, I, I played uh, quite a bit more, just uh, practicing and learning, and then, um, uh, but not super serious, and then, yeah, mm -hmm. I started casting, and uh, I didn't really play at all when I was casting until very recently, uh, when I started streaming started actually taking it seriously and, and trying to learn and, right. and get better but yeah that's my that's my um relationship with starcraft in a nutshell i guess and what impact would you say that not just starcraft but gaming in general has had on you in terms of how it shaped you the benefits the negatives how has it impacted your life i think it's had like some positives and negatives um some of the negatives like have what? been like um for example in uh college when i was at college i mm -hmm. played i played a lot of league of legends and i wasted a lot of time <laughs> i didn't really <laughs> interface a lot with other people i just like did my classes you know got my right. grades and i just didn't like do a lot of activities because i was busy all the time playing mm -hmm. playing league um what a waste of time, man. What an absolute waste of time. So uh, th those are some of the negatives is that you can end up wasting a lot of your, your free time when you should be out there like 
really interfacing with other people and building connections with other people and place like college. That's really what it's all about. And what I didn't realize mm. was like getting, getting the degree was not really even necessary or really important. It's all about like meeting the people, right? Networking, Networking and, stuff. and stuff. Yeah. So I, I didn't really do very well with that. That's one of the big negatives. The positive is that I always have something uh, to do that is, you know, inexpensive. So I was always very good at saving my money and I always had money to, to spend on other things because I wasn't going out and doing, you know, spending a lot on other things, um, unnecessary things. I was just, you know, hanging out, right. doing my own thing, playing some games. Um, and then I would always have savings um, that I could do the fun things that I really want to do, like traveling around. Um, mm -hmm. so it, it is like a really great money saving tool, but I think that it can be a massive distraction from, from the things that are really important. I think I've had a similar experience where it's like help promote a sense of minimalism of mm -hmm. not needing a lot, but also, yeah, like a big time sink as well and hard to balance that sort of like play in life dynamic and can be easy to be absorbed into those digital realms too, too deeply. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, really some sometimes like <laughs> some points in my life i've been so addicted like really couldn't get anything done but i've found somewhat of a balance i'm still working on it but yeah there's there's a there's a real difficulty there i can imagine for young people growing up now who are so immersed um it, it's got to be hard it's got to be difficult yeah yeah, I mean, you said earlier about like it being difficult to navigate childhood as like high school as like in 2024. And I do agree with you. There's a lot of like difficulties there for kids, especially girls. I think maybe girls get it the worst, especially young girls because of the social media thing of like the social shaming of it all, where it's mm -hmm. like not only can the girls be mean to you on the playground, but they can like socially shame you like to the world and like put you on blast and there's like maybe a, a lot more social pressure going on in the younger generations as a result of that social media access well yeah there's there's some wild theories about how the whole like massive move towards transgenderism is as a result of all of that social media pressure online pressure and that victim mentality the victimhood like um ideology that's kind of permeated through a younger culture it's um it's scary the the sort of influence that social media can have on a young person yeah i think um i think like back in our time it was like 4chan was like the place where these kinds of crazy ideas would manifest and if you had access to it, maybe you'd be subject to some of that kind of like trolley way of like culturally hacking you into like, you know, there was even like a big movement on 4chan where they were like trying to convince people to become femboys and what have you, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like there was like a big like psychological campaign to like actually convince people to transition and this, this, but now it's the access to these kind of movements is so far reaching that it's easy to be swept up in certain toxic communities that maybe don't have your best interest at heart and might convince you to do something that maybe you isn't actually in your best interest but can be so compelling to you given your current life situation and this group that seems so accepting of you can actually lead you down a path that maybe later on isn't kind of where you want to go dude i saw a f just a hilarious meme um couple of days ago maybe it was yesterday mm. uh where oh, well. there was like a boomer and the boomer says i can't believe that i i wore bell bottoms and then uh there was like a millennial um no no gen millennial gen x, gen gen x. x. Gen z what, what's after boomers How young? uh Anyway, the the different ones were like, uh, I can't believe that I wore um, parachute pants, and I can't believe that I wore skinny jeans. And then oh, it yeah. says like Gen Z, and it's like I can't believe I cut my dick off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. It was really, really funny. Uh, I mean, that's the interesting how fast times change. Like, I think Ricky Gervais made a uh, a joke that was perceived very transphobic about this, where he talked about how, like, I don't know, like 10 years ago, like saying something like women don't have penises, like no one would have a problem with that online. Mm. But nowadays, that's the kind of thing that gets you cancelled type right. thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're a victimizer. You're a victimizer now. The the bar has been lowered yeah. so far, and that's what it that's what um, keeps happening. Mm. Like if you're, you just look at it at, from a communist point of view. Like if you are, uh, like in in China, for example, when the, the communist revolution happened, you were either a red family or a black family. So if you were a red family, then you were one of the good people. Like you were a worker. You know what I mean? If you're a black family, then you're an oppressor. So you can imagine, like, at first, people, like, the aristocracy is all black families, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, like, uh, you know, massive, like, oligarchs and stuff like that would be black families, and they need to be destroyed, you know, they need to be dismantled and punished, right? But it keeps going down, like, they keep lowering the bar and finding new victims, you know, like, or new, you know, new oppressors to victimize, right? So eventually, it's not just those people. It's like a farmer who has a little bit of land, who's got like a cow, you know, and he's like kind of respected in the village. Like he's in a he's a black family, you know, and all of all, all of his family members and his children all need to be destroyed. And like a, a teacher at the local school who teaches math, you know, like he needs to be destroyed because he's you know, an oppressor, you know, and then like the right. guy who ha who has glasses, he can read. So, you know, he's an oppressor. Like it's, it's it just keeps like the bar just keeps on going down until basically yeah, this... everybody is, is destroyed. You know, well, this is the problem with, we saw this in the, the woke movement in the West with like calling people Nazis or fascists. It's right. like, okay, well define Nazi, define fascist. Because if you're saying it's okay to punch a Nazi or it's okay to punch a fascist, but then you're like moving the goalposts on the definitions of these words, mm -hmm. eventually like anyone could be a Nazi, anyone could be a fascist exactly. and it's okay to, to physically attack them. Like what the fuck are we doing here? Yeah, that's, that's the problem. Exactly. It's the bar just keeps moving and, the the justifications um you know they keep getting more and more ridiculous but uh, pretty soon you know it's it's one of those things like you know they say um uh, they they came after the those people and i said nothing and then they came after me and no no one was there to say anything for me you know what i mean right yeah. yeah, and the the irony the irony of those movements is usually the people that will be next on the chopping block are the people that are screeching the loudest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the people. If you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the people who are the most outraged, and like they're usually very privileged themselves relative to their belief structure, which is maybe why they're overcompensating so much because they know that within that belief structure they're next in line to be chopped. Mm -hmm. So they like want to be seen to be very pro that movement, so they don't get the eyes on them kind of thing exactly exactly yeah they're like uh obfuscating a little bit they're trying to anyway they're trying to like um subjugate themselves to the cause such that people aren't well, they're martyring themselves them that way yeah that way it's like oh you're one of us don't worry about you yeah sure you're white sure but yeah you're okay because you're you're about it you know what i mean mm. They're thinking like that. Yeah. It's not good for society, but it's um it's crazy to see it kind of play out all over the West when we're supposedly so anti communist, but these communist ideas have reached in so deeply. To oh yeah. We're psychology. being trolled. We're basically being trolled. Like there's like troll farms dedicated to like stir the pot you know what i mean like russia and china and what have you like there's literally like dedicated state-funded troll farms poking the bear creating fake news and all sorts just to really stir them up as well like it's, it's actually kind of insane how blind they are 
to how manipulated they are. Sorry, how manipulated they are being. They're, they're, they're both manipulative in terms of how they're trying to propagate their own movement, but they're also being manipulated at the same time. You know what I'm saying? That they're, 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 they're acting through the lens of the puppet masters, like being the progressives and setting the tone and the pace for the rest of humanity to follow and fall in line, whilst at the same time as being puppets themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's strange. It's very strange. Calling for government action uh, on issues that ha the government has no reason to be involved in, wanting the government to be more involved than ever in all these like very personal aspects of people's lives and not even thinking about yeah. the consequences of those things at all like not not thinking that you know someone unfavorable to them could be elected mm. and now they've got control over these intimate details of your life you know this type of right. weird weird like thoughtless um just strange virtue signaling positions that you're just not even you're not even considering how that might play out you know what i mean it's, it's very yeah, awkward but, and strange to be fair though the majority of those communities are actually pretty decent people it's just that you only hear about the vocal minority right like mm. a lot of them are just getting on with their lives and don't make it their entire identity and don't beat the wardrobe on social media so much and like right or but, at least have enough going on in their lives that they don't need to do that so much but they won't argue with those people who are beating the no wardrobe they won't because that's because of how vindictive they are to their own kind as well yeah if they if they step out of line they know how rough they're gonna get it right so they just if anything they get it worse yeah yeah so it, it's it fosters this culture of like just following along those all these people who have good intentions are just following along and those really radical people just don't have any uh leash you know what i mean they just keep getting farther and farther out there and there's no pleasing them because you you might tick like most of the boxes like you might be like gay vegan like a, a, a racial minority where you live or something and you might tick a lot of the boxes for them but like there's one box you don't tick and they're like oh fuck off you nazi like mm -hmm. it gets that silly you know what i mean it's like what the what are we doing here like where's the humanity in this like that they, they are being tyrannical and like anti-human whilst at the same time doing it under the guise of like equality it's like maddening like they're literally saying that humans aren't equal while at the same time saying that we need to be we need to like promote equality it's like right. literally clown world type shit yeah no it's 1984 type shit like the the type of um what do they call it um like new speak you know what i mean the new speak uh of like um freedom is slavery uh that type of thing where they they take two opposing words and equate them so that they are both meaningless yeah yeah so you can't even you don't even know what the word means anymore so that they can they well can they control can't the meaning even of it. define the words that they use yeah like go on i'm not trying to be um inflammatory but go ask some of those 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 woke people to define what a woman is and watch them just stammer because they're so scared of saying the wrong thing mm. And they know they don't they haven't thought about it enough to actually have much of a good answer and they'll do very circular logic of like defining the word with itself like they'll say like a woman is someone that identifies as a woman that's using itself to prove itself that's not how you define words you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah they haven't even thought out their own thought their own belief structure they're just literally parroting what the narrative is they haven't even done any kind of introspection on what that even means well, anyone out there who's like interested in this topic, you need to read 1984. I think it's like basic, George Orwell. basic uh, required reading for this day and yeah. age to understand what's actually happening with this. I, th I think it's it, it is, but I think it's starting to go ever. It, it will increasingly be more and more dated. I actually think that I actually think it'll get a lot worse than his those predictions and that 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 one. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that in the next like decade, uh -huh. that's going to be like really out of date in terms of what's going on in the world, which is scary to think about. Mm, I just mean in the in terms of like 
oh, the yeah. way that he was he was talking about language, you know, language mm-hmm. being manipulated in, in order to manipulate sure. the masses. Well, you can if you control if you control language, language literally controls the way you think. Mm-hmm. And I know that maybe people haven't actually thought about this much, but let's just think about that for a second. So if you only speak one language, for example, you're limited to the vocabulary that you've been exposed to to express yourself both introspectively and outwardly to the world. And if you notice when you do try and speak, it sometimes is much more difficult to articulate with uh, words what you're trying to express, right? Like you've got this conceptual thought in your mind, but actually turning that into words on paper or in speech is actually quite challenging for humans, right? Now, language is another level of uh, barrier and um an interface you have to overcome because you you can only express yourself through those the use of those words. So if you further water down language by manipulating definitions and controlling how people speak, you're you're essentially controlling how they think. Because if you're controlling how they speak, you're also controlling how they think. And that's what they're trying to do. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to control how people think for their own ends. It's uh, it's wacky. It's a wild world. I don't know how we got to this from uh, my <laughs> talking your, your about, Starcraft about Starcraft. And you. yeah. Well, why don't you? We can circle back if you want. You can hit me with some questions, and we can bounce back and forth. I don't mind like going off topic a little bit because it's kind of fun too. We can, we can circle back around to some questions, and you shoot me some. I'll shoot you some. Sure, but uh, let me what just take a quick bathroom break here. All right, sounds good. So let's keep going, shall we? Yeah, hit me with some hard questions. Uh, let's uh, let's see. You were planning on becoming a marine, uh, doing submarine work. What's the what's the well? Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I when I was very young, I did want to originally become a Royal Marine Commando, but it later shifted to wanting to be um, a submariner. So, submariner wouldn't have been a marine. Like a submariner would just be the, in the Royal Navy. So you must have had some jobs over the years. What's the worst job that you've ever had? Uh, worst? It's hard to say. Maybe working the hotel, working at like a, a franchised hotel, uh, cleaning rooms and stuff. I did some other extracurricular stuff of like, say, like you know, sweeping the car park or something. But mostly it was just like you know, cleaning rooms, like changing the beds and what have you. Because when I was like in college, earning a bit of extra money. That was hard graft, man. I'd, I'd had podcasts on listening to like um, Richard Feynman or someone like, you know, talking about physics or something to kind of pass the time. But um, that was really hard graft. Also, one thing that really got me through that was um, audiobooks like Spike Milligan's uh, Hitler's Downfall. Really, really funny. Read by Spike Milligan as well. Really, really funny. Got me through those hard times. Uh, yeah, cleaning rooms is not easy, man. Like you got to both be quick and very efficient and be very diligent of like cleaning all the bathrooms and making sure the beds are made nice. That's, that's hard graft, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Cleaning is tough, tough work. I've only done um, like Airbnbs for cleaning, and it is a lot of uh, hard graft for sure. Um, so that's your worst job, hey? You haven't had any like really bad <laughs> situations with the uh, workmates and stuff like that. That's good. Uh, War of the Ducks back though. If I have any, have any issues with workmates and stuff, it's it's whatever to me. I, um, I don't really like drama. So if there's like a, a problem at work, I'll just like roll with the punches. I mean, they can say and do whatever they want. It's not going to really change what I do much. Right. So you've lived in the UK your whole life? Yeah. I mean, I've like temporarily stayed abroad. Like I was in Arizona for like three months, for example. But yeah, pretty much always been here. Oh, what were you doing in Arizona? Uh, visiting a lady, staying with a lady for three months in her house with her. Oh, yeah. Someone you met on the line? Yeah. Interesting, interesting. How how did you like Arizona? Was it good spot? Hot. Hot, too hot for you? It was, like you? it was like you could fry an egg on the pavement, even though it was like winter time. It was like crazy. But at night time, because it's a desert super peaceful and really nice cool breeze and i used to just like do some like wing chung exercises out on the balcony just looking at the mountain range as far as the eye could see it was pretty beautiful in that regard but during the day like hot as balls so you decided to head back home after i mean i was only gonna stay I was only going to stay for three months anyway that was like my my plan i like went like at the start of like thanksgiving 
stayed through Christmas um, up until like my birthday kind of time and then head back. Gotcha. So you've been on a few adventures in your life. You got a, any adventure stories? <laughs> I've got all kinds of crazy ones, but it depends on like where you want to go. Like some of my most interesting stories are like from like, say being in the UK, but like being in a very precarious situation due to like operating on the streets because I'm homeless or something. You know what I'm saying? Like some of my interesting journeys have come from not necessarily leaving the country. What led you to be homeless? Uh, the pandemic and um, stuff transpiring that was kind of out of my control and uh, drama involving like a, sh a shared accommodation type situation. And there was like a guy in there that was like a drug dealer that was like, a, I'm the king of the castle type. I mean, to the point where he would literally be in your room, like telling you he's the king kind of attitude, like literally using those words, right? And I was older than him and not the kind of person you say that to. So there was a lot of tension in the household. So then because I wasn't like falling in line and acting like this guy was the king of the castle, uh, my food started getting stolen out of the, the freezer and not in like a subtle way. I mean, like they'd like take like a pizza, eat the pizza, but then put the box of the pizza back in the freezer to like show you the empty box of pizza. You know what I'm saying? Like mm. back when I was like struggling to feed myself. So I was going like a week without eating sometimes because I just like, I'd use my last money to like buy like a week's worth of shopping before I get paid again. And they would steal my last food and I'd go days without eating because of these motherfuckers. And it got to a point where I just had a fuck enough. And like he was a drug dealer and like had connections, but wasn't like super powerful himself. But I basically had the attitude of like, mate, I don't care. Like send them, like send people to come harass me. I do not give a shit. And because I had that attitude with him, like when something happened to him, he blamed me. Like someone ended up like kicking his door in and like stealing a bunch of his shit. I actually know who did it, but because I'm not a grass, I obviously didn't say who did it. I just was like, it wasn't me. Fuck you kind of thing. Um, and because of that, because I had the attitude of like, fuck you, they just believed I did do it. So there was a court date and I had to go through like crown court and do all this other kind of bullshit. But because of COVID, that all got pushed back and delayed. So basically everything went to shit. So they were like, okay, well, we'll put you in temporary accommodation. We'll put you in this hotel and we'll, we'll try and sort this out and we'll get a court date sorted out. Blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, okay. So and, um, I'm going through like a mental health crisis at this point because my girlfriend's just like killed herself recently and all kinds of crazy stuff going on in my life at the time. So I was not in a good place mentally anyway. And then they, they put me into a hotel temporarily. And then the hotel has to close because of COVID. Mm. And I basically slipped through the net because like they put me in temporary accommodation at this hotel. And then the hotel, like literally a day later of them moving me to this hotel for temporary accommodation so they could figure out what the fuck to do. I, the hotel closed down. I was literally just on the streets. Wow. That's a yeah. perfect storm of things happening, eh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what it was is your... what it is. It's made me a stronger person, but yeah. What was your first night on the street like? Uh, like nothing to me because everything that had been happening to me up until that point was a nightmare. So that was at the time was like waters off a duck's back. I was happy just to like kind of stroll the streets and like not give a shit because I was in such a bad place that like this was easy to me like wandering the streets and the only thing that was a worry was like where to shit so you could be like patrolling the streets and being cold and stuff and yeah it's not nice to be cold but what's really not nice is being like holy shit is the public toilets closed like do I have to walk half an hour to get to a toilet like mm -hmm. you know what I mean like th those are the considerations you start worrying about and that's not nice. That was the thing that was the most daunting. I actually didn't mind like dealing with violent people and like dealing with like the bullshit on the streets that you face. Um, sometimes even life threatening situations. Like I've been in a situation where I was like in a tent temporarily and like there was people like going by and you can hear them say, Oh, we'll come back later and do him. Meaning like they're going to come back later on at night when there's not so many people around and come and like rob me and like fuck, fuck me up. So did you ever get robbed when you were on the street? No. I, I had many fights and many people attacked me and never once got robbed. Hmm. So what's a, what's a crazy story of a fight or a wacky situation when you were on the uh, street? I, well, I've been able to make most people back off from me 
because like I guess I don't necessarily appear outwardly aggressive. Um, I got nicknamed the Iceman by a few people that were operating in the area that were um, kind of like low-level gangsters, I guess, to, to put it in layman's terms. And um, But only because of how I dealt with them, because every time I had some kind of front situation with them where I had to stand my ground, I was very like stoic about it, but also very like in their faces once they got in my face. There was a time where like there was this girl that was getting bullied outside of a hotel where like all the homeless people and gangsters were staying because like they put all the homeless people into hotels at this point. This was like after I'd already been homeless for like a few months. Um, they tried to help the homeless situation because everyone's on the streets in the pandemic. They just put everyone in hotels. Uh, but outside the hotel, there was like this big disturbance because they were basically like fucking with this girl really badly. And I just basically like said to them, like, like stop fucking with her kind of thing. And as soon as like I made any kind of like inclination of them not to fuck with her, they were all up in my business, like all of them. And there was like four or five of them. There was only two of them that were like really outwardly aggressive. And what they tried to do was, while one of them was getting in my face, the other one like tried to jump behind me off to the side. And he like lurched up into my face to kind of try and like scare me. Like, we'll fucking kill you kind of thing. But because I had the attitude of like, I didn't even flinch. I just kind of like, like got down into stance and like kind of like squared up to them both. They both like backed away immediately because I had that initial impression with them. They didn't fuck with me too much. But I think like if I showed them like any fucking kind of fear, they would have fucked with me way more. They were just like trying to like probe me for weakness at that point. So those situations, I didn't get any like kind of fights, but there were situations where I, even when I arrived to that hotel, it was so crazy that like the bouncers were having uh, an altercation with, um, uh, he was either Russian or Polish and he was really drunk and a really fucking big guy. Like, I don't know, like 250 pounds, but like not, not fat, like actually solid. And um, these bouncers were kind of like looking at him, like not too happy about how aggressive he was being. And he was being very violent with them. And I had just arrived at the hotel and because I had this like not give a fuck attitude, I just like started like speaking to him in like Russian or something to like try and get his attention. Like, like just to wind him up a little bit and get his attention. Because the bouncers were kind of like circling around him a little bit and approaching him slowly. But because he was like really screwing up to them, they were kind of a bit nervous to like come too close to him. So I got his attention. And 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 then like I couldn't really vibe with him. Like he was kind of like saying ah fuck off kind of thing. And eventually I got his attention by being like Polsky, like trying to ask him like are you Polish? What are you like? Like just yeah, trying to engage with him a little bit to distract him. And eventually he went, he looked at me and went Polsky ah, and he put his middle finger up to me. So I kind of got his attention a bit. And then after I engaged him a little bit more, he turned his aggression all of a sudden all on me and just like approached me and just like hammered me in the chin with like a fucking powerful hook but because he was now distracted and focused on me the bouncers like came around and grabbed him and put him on the floor and blah 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 and uh yeah so i got into like all these kinds of weird like confrontations and scuffles but probably didn't really experience anything like too crazy like considering the kind of like toxic environment i was in i think i actually kind of got off lightly but only because i had that like not give a fuck mentality because nothing that they were throwing at me was anything compared to the shit I'd recently been going through. So did you find that uh, a lot of people were in the same situation as you, or was it mostly people who were like street people around you? And then mostly street people around me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like kind of the exception to the rule at the time. A lot of them were like already like either addicts or gangster, low level gangsters or, yeah, there was only like one or two people that maybe seemed like they were in slightly similar positions to me, but even those were, even they were like, not so much. They were like more like just more sophisticated people that were taking advantage of the situation. Like a lot of them were like middle men gangsters, which actually had kind of some connections and were using that as a hub to, to do business because they had all these addicts and access to like easy customers and also kind of hop, go operate under the radar because they're getting like a free room and board to like chill and do whatever the fuck they want and operate out of. Right. Right. That's rough. People taking advantage of the COVID situation. There's so many, so mm. many stories of that. So, but now you're here, you've got, uh, 
computer obviously you've got your own apartment <laughs> how did it how did yeah. it turn around for you i mean it was the it was literally the cliche of like picking myself up by the bootstraps which is theoretically impossible picking yourself up by the way but i somehow fucking did it but like not through any easy feat um at the time i was doing all kinds of crazy shit like uh oh uh, is that, you know, that expression like you should fear a man that has nothing to lose mm. like in that moment i felt like i had nothing to lose and i truly have never felt more powerful in my life like genuinely not giving a shit opens the door for so much dangerous behavior that it's it's kind of frightening like the kind of shit i'd be okay with being involved in mm. well you still had your freedom right your freedom was something you could lose uh yes but in a way, no, because even when I was dealing with police, I had a very, like, not give a fuck attitude with them, even. Like, the way I talked to the police was very anti authority. Um, even when I was locked up in cells, which I was locked up in cells quite frequently, I still wouldn't be looking at it through the lens of, like, they got me. It'd be, I'd be, like, meditating or doing press ups or. I'd be doing something in that cell to either have fun or pass the time or to develop myself. And I would always like see it as like kind of a game. And I just like had fun fucking with the police. That was because of my mindset at the time. So in a way, it was like a game to me to mess with the police if they did ever like arrest me for something. So how did you get out of the situation? Well, even while I was fucked up and um, doing drugs and stuff, uh, I tried to reach out to my dad. Uh, I, I got hold of him and spoke to him, but I didn't like meet up with him or anything. But I eventually met up with my my mom and stuff, and I like, got to talking to her. And even though I was still fucked up and living this crazy lifestyle, I still like was able to like kind of connect with her and stuff. And I think she felt really guilty about the whole situation as well um, because of what had happened to me because I'd like slipped through the net during COVID and all this crazy stuff happened to me all at once and. Blah 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 blah. So, using her, I was able to kind of like realign myself because even though I was in this fuck situation, I like kind of saw that this wasn't a great situation. So, I was able to kind of like return to a slightly normal life because of like renewing that connection back to my mom and then like trying to get rid of all the people in my life that were anything attached to that way of life in any way shape or form so any kind of drug dealer or street level gangster or anything even just old acquaintances and friends that were part of that world or new people in that world i just went like cold turkey on everything related to it and i spent like a year building myself back up both psychologically and fi uh, and physically because even though i was in like great shape because of like walking the streets constantly my body still wasn't healthy necessarily because I wasn't like getting good nutrition and what have you. I wasn't sleeping well and all this other good, this other good shit. Mm. So, so it's literally like my, me putting myself through rehabilitation, like forcing myself to go cold turkey on shit. Like I just stopped all drugs all at once. I quit smoking all at once. And I was like laying in bed, like twitching and like having restless legs and like not even being able to sleep and like fidget in and like basically like having like cold turkey sweats and like detoxing myself over a few months and shit. You did that while you were on the streets? No, I did that coming off the streets, like sofa surfing and shit. So you had a friend that got you onto a couch to start? Yeah. So who's this good, Who's this uh, angel friend who saw <laughs> you're kind of fucked up and like you're a drug addict and all that shit? And oh, just I talk too much about a... other people, especially <laughs> when I'm not sure about how much they want me to talk about. Sure, so I won't I say mean, too much about specific people, but you don't have to say their names. to say there was there was enough people that cared that I was able to put myself back together again a little bit, and my mum was a big part of that as well. Like, I, there's a lot of things that I could say negative about my mum, but honestly, like, yeah, when when like push came to shove, like she helped lift me out of that just by being there and like giving me that connection to realign myself to friends and family that I needed more than the people I didn't, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. using that as an anchor helped like kind of realign my brain to being less fried. So you got off the drugs and then you 
what went and found a job or you found some housing how, how did you take steps forward uh well I, I actually couldn't do all those things because i was still in the process of trying to resolve all the court shit because of because of the pandemic it took like years to resolve mm. so i was actually kind of like living under the thumb of like trying to resolve all this court shit as well while trying to rehabilitate myself right so i actually didn't progress as much as i'd wanted to because i'd still do all this other bullshit and that closed the door on some avenues for me like the the, the submariner thing um open some new doors though because it, it it did encourage me to like go back to my roots and like reached out to people i hadn't spoke to in years and i went back to being a little bit of a gamer i wasn't like i didn't go straight back into gaming i kind of like did it more just as a hobby you know what i mean like it took me a long time to actually using using the pc as much as i used to kind of thing hmm. baby steps eh? so eventually yeah you got, it was you got your own place or you got a job or how did you how did you put things together that way well i got i got some assistance after going through what i went through mm -hmm. um i spoke to some people i even was on like because of some of the crazy shit i went through i even had like people ringing me up like people that go through like trauma and like ptsd kind of shit like people like checking up on me and stuff so i had like some mental health support and stuff like helping me go through some of those transitionary periods um which was a big deal for me like even just like knowing like people out there even if they were paid to care there was still like some kind of like human connection going on to like get me started and to kind of help develop some sense of normalcy even though you know what the fuck is normal um and i was able to lift myself up through my passions and hobbies kind of reignited circuits in my brain to help me start to kind of function in society a little bit more normally but honestly, like, I don't think I've ever functioned in society society in a traditional sense just because of, like, my own personal experiences have kind of shaped me into being what I am. And I don't want to fight that too much. If it's my authentic self, I'm going to be against the grain in terms of, like, how I've navigated the world against, compared to someone else. Right. So you managed to get into your own place you've got um this whole court thing still hanging over you do is it over now did it did it resolve itself like what was the outcome yeah it's it's completely resolved and nothing happened but something could have happened if like things had not gone my way so much or whatever like yeah there was a chance i would end up in prison mm. and um i could have ended up in prison on remand uh up until that was resolved and that's the scary thought as if they had taken me on remand that would have mean i was in prison i would have been in prison for like two three years before they even had that court date and then be like oh you need to be here so i, I kind of got lucky in the sense of I, I dodged being taken in on remand and then i would have been stuck in prison for two three years just waiting to resolve this bullshit so that's like a a lucky thing but the judge kind of at the initial hearing not at the crown court but at like the magistrate's court um he kind of had the attitude of like what the fuck is going on here like why are you here like he seemed pretty on my side initially so i, I guess that's why he didn't take me on remand because it's like the whole thing seemed a bit ridiculous to him as well so mm. i don't think he wanted to take me on remand which is why i didn't get on get on that but i could have been in prison for like two three years just waiting to resolve this right right so you uh you kept seeing that drug dealer guy the old roommate in in court over and over again no he didn't he didn't show up in court but his like parents did you know what i mean like he was like too much of a chicken shit to actually show up and um, that must have gone in your favor as well hey yeah i wonder what the parents are even thinking no i don't care hmm. strange strange well i'm glad it's it's all worked out you're uh you're not in jail you're not in prison you've uh gotten yourself off the street you've re you found a, a reinvigorated love for your passions. That's that's awesome, man. Mm. Thank you. I mean, it's been a journey and it's made me who I am. So I'm not gonna. Ch I wouldn't want to change it for the world as well. You know what I mean? Like I, I feel like it's given me that anti fragility that I need. Right. After hearing that, my 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 like, what kind of turmoils have you gone through in your life? I know you've had like a motorcycle accident and um. 
you dealt with that quite stoically from what you described before but i'm curious if there has been any other like not necessarily traumas but like you know break points in your life where like the rubber met the road and shit got real for you <laughs> nothing as um crazy as what you've just described of course but uh, i've had a few like um turnaround moments i guess some things that have like uh, really changed my direction in my life um as you know i, I live in in japan but i've also lived in china before this i um yeah. moved to china after university and uh, i studied chinese in in university um as well as business Chinese or mandarin mandarin and I moved to southern China and with the intention of um, becoming fluent in Chinese and eventually working for a company, uh, you know, that uh, does business between China and Canada. Mm. Um, but I quickly realized how corrupt and dangerous it was to live in, in China and to be a part of uh, that society and to be... like involved in that country in any like deep respect will like deeply stain you as well as a person like if you're if you want to do business basically you have to play ball right you have to be willing to be like with that moral standard right, right. um so i i realized that that's not that's not for me and i i needed to get out of there so that was like a big turning point in my life where I had been working towards that as like a, a goal of my of mine for many, many years. It was like uh like five, seven years of study, constant study, right. you know, aiming for a certain goal and then realizing that this was not this is not what I want for my life. This is not my idea. Uh this is not what I thought it was. Um, I thought this is not a peak you want to reach. Yeah, this is like a, not a not a land of opportunity. It's a land of degradation and you know corruption and uh, this is this is not what I want for my life. So I had to change completely, change gears, and look outwards to something else. You know, and I had to go on a bit of a soul searching journey. So I went all over um, Eastern, Southeastern Asia. A uh, long backpacking journey with just a small, like, uh, fifteen liter backpack, something like that, on my back, just a few clothes, and, um, you know, just kind of soul searching, looking, looking around. Um, what did you find? Uh, I just I love travel, man. I really enjoyed it a lot. I had a great time. It wasn't um. It wasn't so much that I found like a new calling or anything like that. I just found that uh i am completely capable of living with almost nothing and it was really freeing you know just a couple of clothes a couple of pairs of clothes and um the road and you know some money in my bank account i was completely fine totally satisfied really happy enjoying my life yeah. you know, it turned my idea of like what i wanted for the future um on its head like what do I need? What do I actually need? I started thinking a lot more. I started uh, reading a lot more. I started listening to a lot more audiobooks and realizing that like the the secret to happiness is is like wanting less and needing less, you know, and just uh -huh. uh, like that minimalist mentality came out of that uh, that time for me. So yeah, I learned a lot. I learned a lot on that travel, and I eventually. Um, from that experience, realized like the importance of freedom, the importance of like never, never, you know, discount how important freedom is. Like that's why I asked you when you were talking about like I, I had nothing to lose, and my first response was like, well, you you still had your freedom, right? Like the freedom is, freedom is so valuable. Right. People don't think about it, especially not in the West, because it's kind of like a, gar a given. It's a guarantee. Freedom is I don't know, though. so it's so valuable, man. If you go to I, go to a country like China, you go to a con yeah, country, yeah. you realize like, oh, these people are not free. Like they don't have that 
the ability to to do what they want or to say what they want um they're limited you know and being unlimited being free is is so valuable i also think that people in the west though very are quick to trade their freedoms for mm -hmm. like security and comfort as well though and that, but, but but because they take it for granted though because mm -hmm. they they have it as a given it's taken much more for granted and kind of like not really respected or i think people like operate through the lens of they value autonomy above all else but when push comes to shove like during the pandemic like we were talking about like they're more than happy to throw away those freedoms just for a little bit of comfort and a little bit of security blanket yeah yeah that was uh, a big wake up a wake up call like oh my gosh people people really don't value their freedom at all they're really not even thinking about like they're willing to just let the government do whatever they want, uh, you know, take all my uh, information, track everybody, you know, yeah. just to... All, all under the guise of, like, you know, saving humanity and preventing a crisis or whatever, like... Mm -hmm. Just, like, uh, your your freedom is not worth dying for, you know what I mean? That's not It's not worth, like, the risk of infecting other people or something like that you know that's yeah. what people were saying and it's like man just a generation ago people were willing to literally die for mm -hmm. freedom and now you're mm -hmm. here not even willing to take a one percent risk that you might get sick you know or die yeah yeah and you're willing yeah. to throw away that freedom it's it's unbelievable i'm i'm sure there's a lot of older generations that would be turning in their grave at like how lackadaisy people are about their freedoms considering people fought and died for those freedoms and mm. suffered crazy atrocities and saw their friends being blown apart to secure those freedoms yeah yeah so i don't know it, it that that sort of uh was like a seminal moment for me that like change in mentality when i was in uh when i was in china and um realizing like oh shit this is really important like freedom is so important i need to live somewhere that's free and uh in a lot of ways japan is a very controlled culture like there's a mm. lot of kind of like limitations in terms of uh, uh you know what's acceptable in japan but right at the same time they don't track you they don't uh they have a lot of really uh strong privacy protection laws in japan they really don't get into people's business as much i wonder um, if that's why there's such a voyeur kink in japan mm, i don't know but um there's there's just a, a deep respect for privacy i think that is like very uh incongruent or is is very like a parallel uh, mm. It's it, it's in step with the ideas that a lot of other countries will ascribe, you know. But then there, the privacy right. is just not there. Like the UK, for example, has some of the most security cameras out of any country in the world, right? Like there's almost a security camera for every person, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, CCTV everywhere. So there's well, the UK. The UK used to be the CCTV capital of the world, but that's changing a little bit. Mm. Yeah, there's there's more than one CCTV camera for each person in China, right? Like, there's multiple mm -hmm. for each person, and that's getting worse. Um, yeah. yeah, that's the big brother George Orwell type thing. But before we go too deep on this, I want to keep the subject on you a little bit. So... Mm -hmm. You've got a lovely, 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 lovely wife, and oh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about her, but I just want to know how you two met and like what the situation was like coming together in your relationship. Um, so I was in Japan during the the pandemic, and the mm -hmm. pandemic when it hit, it didn't really hit that hard here in Japan. Like, um, the uh, there was like that weird event with the cruise ship. If you guys remember. Some of you guys out there yes, might remember that. I do remember. Ship I do remember. That docked in Japan and it was like a big thing because they were mm -hmm. bringing, there was like a lot, a lot of people on there with COVID. And yeah. And so, they were kind of like locked down on the cruise, the, the cruise ship. 
Yeah, so they were wondering what to do about that, and um, because of the more <clears throat> tightly regulated government, like the government is not as uh, it doesn't have as much authority to do like total sweeping lockdowns as it does in, um, for example, my country in Canada. They didn't like lock everything down, um, and they were very focused on like maintaining uh the, the flow of society which is something that the, like conservative governments are good at right like they they're they're not very uh willing to make like big changes sweeping changes excuse me <clears throat> they're not mm. willing to make like really big sweeping changes really quickly and like alter society in a really fundamental way uh in reaction to some new event right so they were they were very like calm about it uh they told everyone to mask and then they were like um we're gonna close everything for two weeks and then they closed everything for two weeks and then they opened everything back up again and it was basically back to business after those two weeks um so everything was still running but People were, of course, not going out as much. They still had rent. Restaurants were still open and allowed. You, you were able to go, but bars were supposed to be closed at like 10 p.m. or something for a long time. Um, so the, the, the society still functioned. I still went to work. Everyone still went to work. It was yeah. totally normal. Nobody, nobody just stayed home. Um, everyone was back to work, basically, after two weeks. And... Uh, the only thing was that the the social aspect wasn't really there anymore. Like socially, it was became even harder to meet or talk to people. Um, so uh -huh. everyone was. It's like well known. It's very like uh, it's uh, kind of um stereotypical that people in Japan they don't communicate well and they don't socialize much. But uh, it became even worse during COVID, and mm -hmm. uh, so I started. I started doing some online dating, and my wife was living in a city like two, about an hour away from me by train, and okay. we we ended up meeting online, and um, we started hanging out, going on hikes together and stuff, um, and then she moved to a uh, big city, Nagoya, and which is a little bit nearer to me. And mm. I uh, finished out my two-year contract with the school that I was working with, and I rented a van, um, put a put a bed inside of it, like a contraption in the back, so that it would be kind of like a camper. And I drove all over Japan. Um, I took her with me for about uh, a month, I think. No, not a month. Um, like 10, 15 days, something like that. We went together, and I traveled for like a month, a little bit over a month. <clears throat> and um yeah we had a really good time uh and then we moved in together i moved into her place in nagoya while i was trying to figure out what i was going to do next uh whether i wanted to stay in japan or go back and uh we haven't split up since then we've been together ever since now at some point you did you move back to canada with her then yeah yeah we moved back to canada and uh we stayed a year at my parents place um mm. just found jobs in my uh my hometown and just worked and uh saved up money so that we could do another travel experience i had a dream that i really wanted to drive from uh canada to south america and um it was actually impossible because the ferry that goes from peru to colombia got canceled during covid so they, they don't do it anymore no. So uh, we 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 wanted to go drive down through Mexico, maybe down into Central America, something like that, and we ended up saving up money for a year, um, and we bought a vehicle and drove down through the U.S. Uh, and we ended up breaking down in California. the The vehicle just totally crap crapped out, Oof. and uh, so we ended up uh, just going backpacking instead. It was it was a bit rough, but through it all we had like a really good experience together um we never fought or had really hard times like we always relied on each other really well 
What's interesting about mm. that is because the car broke down, mm. you were like kind of forced to like hike and backpack together, mm. like how you met. You met through dating and hiking together. It's kind of interesting that you went full circle on that and ended up being forced to go back to how you met kind of thing. Yeah, well, we were both um, just uh, adaptable. You know, we, we didn't freak out and like run home or anything. We're just like, we're just going to just going to uh, salvage the situation find a way through you know nice. try to enjoy the experience sailing and, uh, with the tides rather than trying to row too much yeah so we did a bunch of backpacking around and then um i got hit by a car <laughs> unfortunately Oof. got hit by a truck while riding a motorcycle uh just stopped at a yeah. red light yeah stopped at a red light somebody hit me from behind and just drove off hit and run damn yeah and then uh we came back to japan after I started to feel better, after I got uh, some some um, rehabilitation, after that we came back to Japan to hang out with um, Mio's grandfather before he passed. He was uh, sick with uh, with cancer, so we spent some time with him. And now we're now we're here. We're in Japan. Who told you that Zen story? Yeah, he was the one who who talked who who brought up the the Buddhist story of um, yeah. The the man with the with the horse. So yeah, it's um it's been a wild ride, man. It's been a wild adventure. Not quite as wild as uh, your COVID story, but yeah. Nah, we, we've had we they've been wild in our own respects. Like what you've done is in some respects cooler than what I what I went through. You know what I mean? Like it's all relative. I think mine was more fun. That's for sure. <laughs> 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 Sounds like it. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe maybe a lot of people in my position would have not been having a very good time, but yeah, I kind of rolled with the punches. So I can't complain too much. That's good. But yeah, yeah. Stay, staying on topic, um, what do you think makes you, and if you're comfortable staying on topic with this particular subject, what do you think like makes you two like, compatible? Like, what, what is it about you two that you think just works? Hmm, it's a good question. Hmm. I think we're both um just very chill. We don't um we're not like uh vying or jockeying for position, you know. We're not like trying right. to like uh bully each other, push each other around at all. Like we're both right. just kind of doing our thing and uh supporting each other and yeah, I don't know. I don't know what works so well, but it just just works. We just uh we're just always hanging out, having a good time. <laughs> we're not um you know, we're not Would you consider her your best friend as well as your partner? Yeah, I, I don't I don't have a huge amount of friends, man. I'm I'm pretty limited mm -hmm. in uh my friend circle right now. I'm in Japan. Um you're the person that I talk to the most out of anybody. Oh, really? Um, aside from her, of course, but um, <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah, someone, someone in the comments did recently ship us a little bit and say something ab about us, which made me laugh a little bit, thinking that people are going to ship us a little bit. If you know what I'm saying? Mm. I mean, I kind of know what you're saying. Like they're they're saying like uh, we're talking so much that uh, we must be like dating or something, something like that. <laughs> kind of yeah i'm just i'm a little bit worried that like if we get popular enough in like years to come like we might get like some fan fiction made about us or something oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I always had this problem when i was uh younger was would be that i would like vibe with a really close friend and then you know people would start to talk shit about us and then they would like they would run away. Like this happened to me one time. This is a really concrete example is mm -hmm. um, I was on a trip um, when I was in high school. I was really into rugby and played a lot of rugby. Um, I got invited to join a team that was like a team from another town. They were just looking for a, a people to join them on this trip to go to South Africa to play rugby. And it was basically anyone who could afford, oh. anyone who could afford to to join the trip could basically join the team and come. So, 
Nice. I, uh, you know, I got my parents to agree, and they they paid for this trip. I went to you played rugby. Yeah, I played rugby in South Africa, and uh, holy shit! Yeah, it was a really good time. Really, really. What position did you play? Uh, I was in the I was in the scrum. I was like uh, what position? Prop. Yeah, or second row. Wait, what? Oh, second row. Yeah, I, I was tight head prop. Okay, so you've been behind me then. Yeah, or prop. I played prop sometimes. I played second row sometimes. Like depends on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. depends on um, the team or whatever. But the um the the story is that I I had one another guy um from my school who I kind of got along with. His name was Tanner, and uh, Tanner. we you know we were kind of vibing like during practice and stuff. We were hanging out and talking and stuff and. Um, everything was going pretty well. And, uh, you know, if we had to room in a hotel during the trip, we would share the same room, right? Because we were, we were both on the same level. We were both cool with each other. And, um, I I thought of him as a pretty good friend. He seemed like a pretty cool guy. And, uh, I, you know, I told him like, we're, we're going to, we're going to Africa. Like you watch my back. I'll watch your back. You know, like, let's, Mm -hmm. let's not get robbed. Let's not have anything uh bad happen right and um yeah so you know we were cool with that and we were hanging out all the time and then one time i remember vividly that um we were on the bus and uh some some people started making comments about him and i being too close together do you know what i mean like uh, oh yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. got what are you guys gay or something like what what the hell is going on between you two and he just like nah i'm not I'm not like that. And then he stopped hanging out with me and uh, oh. started hanging out with other people. Right. And uh, yeah, so that was really um, th- that type of shit happened to me a lot. <laughs> I've always been the type of person who has uh, a few really close friends. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not really like great at uh, being a social right. butterfly, hanging out with a whole bunch of different people. I mostly gravitate to just a few close people and then I get like really close with those people, and I, you know, really get to know them very, very well. And um, sometimes that can be the yeah. best way, though. Yeah, I, I find it's the best way, but some people just they're not able to handle social pressure at all, and like that t- sort of like awkward, awkwardness just like completely repels <laughs> other people. You some people, yeah. You wouldn't have that issue with me saying I'll, I'll be right or die, man. Like, I'd have your back, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I could tell. Yeah, like, say if I was in, like, even, like, Love Snow, who I'm not even that close to, and he started some bullshit, even if he was in the wrong, I'd try and explain to him why he was in the wrong, but I'd also defend him in the situation, you know what I'm saying? Mm. I'd also have his back, even if he was in the wrong. Same with you, like, I'd I'd have your back, even if you were in the wrong. (laughs) I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, um... It's a beautiful thing, like a close friendship. You gotta have a few of them in your life. Uh, I think that that's something that's going away for a lot of people too. Like I've heard so many stories or so many like news articles and stuff saying that uh, men are not having as many friends or not having right. any friends. These people that don't have any friends, like man, that's that's a sad state of existence when you don't have any friends. Well, they're being their 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 wants are being catered to because they're lonely, right? So they're getting parasocial connections through streaming and OnlyFans and what have you, and they're still getting kind of some sense of connection, but it's not it's what they want, not what they need, right? So it's a, I don't want to go too deep into that subject. We're still talking about you, but yeah, we talked about that on our um was it our Incel podcast? We did talk a little bit about that. Mm. Parasocial relationships and that type of thing, yeah, yeah for sure, yeah, yeah. a little bit. But okay, well, question then. So, mm. so based on what everything you said, do you consider me a close friend then? Yeah, I would consider you a close friend for sure. Nice, I'd consider you a close friend too, buddy. Yeah, I mean, we spent enough time chatting back and forth, get to know each other a little bit more through this podcast. It's nice. Not really, yeah. I mean, we've spent a lot of time in uh in kcm <laughs> without any like deeper conversation but except for like maybe after s- some short conversations but 
Yeah, well, maybe good. that's one thing we could talk about. Like, mm. let's now that we've like we've done a little bit of a dive on each other as individuals, should sure. we try and talk about us as a duo a little bit? So, what, okay, so we, we we met through a mutual acquaintance, Love Snow, right? Mm. Um, what what let's talk about what our first impressions of each other, and like, and and so the listeners can know like how that actually came about us ending up casting KCM together. Like, how how was that process from your perspective? I honestly was thinking about this a couple of days ago. I was like, what did we do? What was the first thing that we did together? I just, I couldn't even remember what, what was the first occurrence. Like it was some sort of just you and me. And I, I think a love snows stream. And yeah, he, was, he stream. was doing a stream. And then it was like, maybe uh, Ozzy might've been in there too. Yeah, and he we was. were all just talking shit and, you know, love snows super hammered. Um, <laughs> we're all just making fun of him. I, I think, you and I were going back and forth with some sort of joke that the other the other guys were like too embarrassed to 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 go back and forth, but you and I just kept like going harder and harder, you know, like <laughs> yeah. making it making it Re-reaching, more and more yeah. silly, yeah. And and then I was like, <laughs> yeah, this guy this guy uh can hang. Maybe we can do a a cast together sometime. Nice, nice. So what was your first impressions of me as a caster, I mean? Like when we first started casting together, like what were the vibe you got from me at the time? Um, I can't remember what you were like the first few casts. I remember that we were having a a bit of a hard time like um going back and forth and like bouncing off each other, but it kind of mm-hmm. corrected itself pretty quickly. Like we figured it out. Um Yeah. It didn't take too long to like to to make it work properly, but up until that point, I was casting with a whole bunch of different people. Like I had tried um, quite a few people who would hit me up in Discord and said like, hey, uh, I have this experience. Do you want to try casting together? Um, and we never uh, quite had that like back and forth really down. It didn't feel like a conversation when we were right. casting. It felt like uh, two people like trying to do their own solo cast like talking over each other or it was me like you know giving room for the other person and like trying to uh you know give them space to cast and then they weren't giving me the same you know what i mean right so right right right. yeah it was um definitely from the first kcm cast that we did together i felt like there was like that mutual uh feeling of like giving room for each other like you're giving me some space i'm giving you some space and like we're both riffing well yeah i to speak to speak on that more i i i want to ask i do want to ask you specifically like what do you think our individual strengths and weaknesses are as casters and why we work well together but i first wanted to quickly touch upon how I feel like we always had that like natural chemistry from day one. It's just, we needed to figure out like the technical, the technicalities a little bit. I would argue that I was probably a bit rusty as a caster. Then I'd done casting in the past many, many years ago. In fact, I even did a bit of casting back in the Winamp days, like literally a podcast style cast where there's not even visuals. It's Mm. like a radio show for Starcraft where you're just being described what's happening. I mean, that level of cast, like that long ago. Mm. So I always had a little bit of caster experience, but I did do Starcraft 2 casting for a sponsored team and I was on their main caster team, but I hated that dynamic. There was like three people casting and one of them wasn't even a proper caster. He just managed the team, but wanted to to insert himself into every cast mm. and he got to a point where he was dictating the cast where it was like he was the main person talking and he'd be like Jean what do you think about that and that's the only time I got to talk was when he would turn to us and ask us a question or something it was a really toxic work environment I just dipped out of it and didn't want to cast for like years as a mm. result but when I found CPL and you that kind of re-sparked my passion for casting again so I kind of like have you to thank in that regard because you i was casting before you in terms of like doing cpl casts and what have mm-hmm. you but i wasn't super passionate about it like i am right now after like really getting involved with kcm again mm. yeah that's good to hear man that's good to hear yeah i i seen some very awkward casts before and i've actually done um what you're talking about where uh at one point i was doing um whatever africa tv broadcast that i was doing and just having it be a video like this where it's just my voice 
and then uh having like a a sinking guide you know what i mean where uh like we would uh the the player or the person would have the the game open on another tab and then have my voice in the background and then there would be like a guide to sync up the video so that they could watch with my voice it did okay but it wasn't wasn't very successful so i ended up quitting the that uh that style <laughs> just giving up on it but um <laughs> yeah i know exactly what you're talking about like just having like a podcast version of a starcraft cast it's tough to make it popular though man that's really really hard to, to yeah i was doing gimmick i was doing like funny little gimmicks where like when there was nothing happening at the start i'd do like funny voices or like i would do the entire cast of an american accent and just see mm -hmm. if i could fool people into not knowing i was actually british i'd find some way of having fun with it or doing dumb things like going he's building a supply depot i'll do mm -hmm. some dumb shit to entertain them because all, all i've got is my voice so i kind of like did some dumb shit to be entertaining but yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to talk about me too much. Um, I want to know what you think about what makes us, what, what are our individual strengths and weaknesses as casters and why we work well together? Mm. What do you think? I think we work well together because we're just having fun. Like, that's, that's what people want to hear. Like, they want to hear right. two people who love the game having fun. Uh, you know, just uh, like a lot of people when they're watching, they might even understand the game way more than us, right? They might understand like what's happening on an even deeper level than we do. But mm -hmm. um, it's not necessary that they that we, you know, explain everything perfectly or that we understand the game way better than they do. And, and they're actually going to learn something from us. It's more important that they're uh, getting the feeling of, two people you know enjoying enjoying the game do you know what i mean it adds to their enjoyment yeah. so i think that we both just love the game and we both um have like a passion for the game we have like a real excitement you know what i mean and then the people mm -hmm. who are listening can feel it and when they feel it <laughs> then they they enjoy the the cast and they enjoy the game more i guess it's kind of like if you're like hanging out with your buddies, like watching a sports game together, like it's way more exciting if you're all jumping together and shouting together mm -hmm. and having those casters being excited with you while you're watching it kind of hypes up the situation for you even more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think that's our, our biggest strength. I think we both have that like passion and, um, and like the excitability for the game, right? We just love, we love to see the crazy moments and like mm -hmm. yeah we're we're good at yeah, I think uh, we're... we're both we're both good at like shout casting we're both good at uh you know analysis breakdown that type of stuff i, I think we're both well, pretty well rounded that's the thing is that even though we have some distinctive styles like you could argue that you're the the karma reserved one mm -hmm. like the more composed artosis and i'm the the, the, the so-called hype man but it's not actually true we do like kind of switch our gears a lot and both do those roles like i'll sometimes do something analytical and chill and you'll sometimes do something crazy and hype it's just that we also have this like energy dynamic where i'm using you as like an anchor to like kind of keep me keep me down onto earth so i can ping pong around and go on like crazy tangents and riff with like references and be really hyped for like 20 seconds and go crazy and let my brain go on hyperdrive but then suddenly you're like this like calm reserved energy that brings me right back down again and i can like slip back into my analytical mindset even though i've just like gone crazy for a few seconds mm -hmm. yeah for sure um I'm glad I can be that for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're my rock, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I definitely feel that energy, like that uh, things are starting to go off the rails, and I don't, um, I don't resist it. I just like control it and move it in the right direction. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're 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 a pretty good team, I think. I think so. It um. Oh. Mm -hmm. what could we work on like what's our biggest weakness what 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 do you think leaves some to be desired you know what i mean mm.
Do you have any ideas on that? Let me think for a minute. I'm thinking too. Um, I mean, I could be like really nitpicky, but I'm trying to think of actually like something with meat to it. It's good that we're struggling to come up with stuff. We 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 mm. covered a lot of the potholes already over the over the year. Um, I think we could be more. We could add more jokes, more more silliness to the cast too. Yeah, it's weird though because I was kind of going in that direction, mm. and then I kind of shifted out of those gears a little bit. Like I was doing way more like comical references and jokes in like say previous seasons, and I kind of dialed it back a little bit mm. and i think i dialed it back a little bit too much as well i feel like i need to find that balance again between the two yeah I th speaking I th from I my could, side of things i could probably turn it on a little bit more in terms of like joking around it would be maybe it would be more like palatable if i was more um you know more that way as well if it's just mm. you doing it all the time then it maybe becomes like uh yeah you know, tiresome well, i don't know but if, if maybe we're, if we're more going back and forth then it would be maybe better something i can work well, on well maybe maybe you could play the role of instigator more and like you know stir the pot to get me going more so mm. it's like rather than me having to rev my own engine up you're kind of like revving me up as well like you're like treating me like a wind-up toy you know what i mean mm, yeah i'm just letting you go um yeah, yeah maybe maybe something to think about I think we've we've hit a pretty good level already. It's just um yeah. Uh, now we're more, just polishing, right? With more yeah, with more time and uh more practice, we'll have better lines, you know, like things things won't mm -hmm. be th things will be so smooth, you know, so like so easy to just to cast together that we'll have the the ability to like do those extra things you know what i mean to like add on right. those extra layers maybe do like more preparation stuff like think of jokes beforehand that we can throw at each other uh during mm -hmm. the cast that type of thing especially if we can like you know establish some like inside jokes with the community because we're doing that right so like they feel like they're they're part of it more like we did we did some of those things but like for example i do the whole gorilla and ape references and stuff but mm -hmm. that's like just one thing we could do so much um sure. so we should probably have more like stock material to work with so that when in the moment we we aren't like coming up with something creative based on that moment we have these like other inside jokes we can pull out of the pocket and riff with more mm -hmm. we're letting the people in too deep to our creative uh creative process creative process <laughs> People watching I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think this is <laughs> this is cool. And Artosis and Tasteless did talk about some of their creative process in the past. I remember them saying that they went through a phase uh, where, like, it, like every cast, they were like analyzing afterwards, like what they could have done and what they could have done differently. We did a little bit of that, didn't we? Where it was like, especially in the early days, we were like being a little bit nitpicky with ourselves and trying mm. to like catch ourselves out a little bit and try and iron out those creases more because we needed to, like back when we first started. I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think we did do some some extra like analytical stuff looking back over our our cast and like discussing what we should do better. Mm. Yeah, like the I remember some some serious conversations about talking over each other, <laughs> cutting each other yeah. off. <laughs> yeah, but uh that's like that's something that uh, came pretty quickly once we identified it and like really worked on it directly well i think we've always had respect for each other as casters players and humans so it wasn't really easy it wasn't really hard to iron those creases out like it wasn't like we got personally offended when we brought those issues up we no. we were just we were like men about it you know we just told each other what was up and we dealt with it right mm. teeing each other up yeah teeing each other up teeing getting those tea levels up. are rising <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's it's so important in a cast to like tee each other up and and have each other yeah. like g give clear breaks where it's like okay now it's your turn to talk like right at that moment mm -hmm. and the other person knows it and they don't they don't have so, to like wait for their turn to jump in and it and it's so easy to be greedy like I could like go on a tangent and there's like a fight about to happen and I could also take that 
play by play or mm. I, sometimes i could just tee you up and be like oh what are you saying have fun with that you know what i mean mm, yeah. i was like talk like crazy up until the moment of engagement like bang bounce the ball back to you and you're like doing the play by play instantly mm-hmm. yeah or vice for versa sure. for sure absolutely what I really like is uh, there's a lot of times where we're not only teeing each other up on the the cues on when to come in, but like just in general, like I think that we do a pretty good job of like bouncing the ball between us. There's times where we're dribbling maybe a little bit too much on both levels, but there's a lot of times where the bounce back between us is actually like really fluid and like organic. Yeah, I'm getting a good sense of like when your sentence is about to end. So I'm like really like right as you end what you're saying i'm ready right. to keep going and so there's like very small gaps between uh, what each of us are saying yeah. yeah i mean it's crazy how people probably take that for granted but it's actually crazy how difficult it is to say like i'll be like just listening to you talk for ages and then all of a sudden like you'll, you'll stop talking but because i'm so dialed in and casting with you i can just go as soon as you stop this and vice versa right it's like we're just like chilling with each other and having that natural synergy going. But when the ball is being bounced between us, it's like, like you say, there's no downtime. It's like, as soon as that ball bounces, it's like, it's you're now dribbling it. And it's like the flow still go. Yeah. And we set each other up for like alley-oops and all kinds of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We could work on that. Just setting the setups, that type of thing. But yeah. I mean, it's, it's there it just needs to be polished. Like you said, well, like you, yeah, and it will come with time because, as you say, it's like the more the more we do this, the more natural it will be. It already is kind of like that now, right? Like it's not like we're sweating and like we're shaking with anxiety while we're casting. We're actually, mm. you know, fairly competent at it. We're kind of adept right now. We're trying to be masterful. You know what I mean? Like we're in the mm. process of turning that that adeptness into mastery. Right. Well, man, we've, uh, I think we've almost gone four hours, bro. I think we need to cut this one off. Yeah, we can do that. It's been a good, uh, it's been a good run, guys. We had some, uh, some interesting conversation here. Maybe a little, uh, background knowledge about the two of us. Get to know us a little bit better. We've got to know each other a little bit better as well, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's crazy, actually. Each week, I feel like I'm a little bit closer to you, and I'm all about it. Nice. So, We'll be back next week, guys. Um, make sure to give a like on the video. Maybe share it with your friends if you're really enjoying these conversations. We're going to keep going. We're going to uh, put the effort in uh, to continue to improve the, the podcast here, just like we do with uh, KCM and our, our other uh, projects, our, our uh, co-operative product projects here, <laughs> uh, products. Yeah. Um, this is should be a better audio quality. Uh, this one, I know that the the visual is probably going to look a lot different, but uh, that's just because we're we're using a different um, medium for for uh, communication in this in this video. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to say, Shun? Yeah, um, I'll just wrap up by saying so. Please do not hesitate, guys. If there's anything you would like to hear us discuss on the podcast, either a particular topic or subject or something happening in the world you know, tell us in the comments. We'll be definitely considering that. We want you guys to also be involved in the conversation a little bit and maybe bring some talking points to the table and we'll do our best to explore those for you. And uh, besides that, I just want to say like a pleasure as always, Sam. Um, oh, uh, a little quick explanation on why everything's a little bit different now. Basically, we wanted to increase the bit rate on Discord for when we're casting and doing this uh, recording for the the podcast here so we're using a, a boosted server instead and increasing the bit rate of the channel to like 256 kilobits rather than 64 so hopefully i sound tiny bit better for you now because saiyan's recording me by discord right so hopefully it sounds better let us know in the comments down below guys that's it for today see you next time peace